All right, it's time for the lightning talk session, please. Our first talk is uh, David Braska of Nine High AI Strategy Corporation. Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Morosk. I'm president and CEO of AI Strategy. Here to talk about Nine High today. I aim to get this done between four and four and a half minutes, so I'm going to run through this real quick. So Nine High is a novel AI enabled platform for uh, risk assessment. Um, sorry, actually, you're covering this. Is there a way that I can see the screen here? Okay, great. Thank you. For risk assessment and mitigation decisions for any technology innovation need. Um, what we do is we assess, we can assess a specific technology investment or an emerging um, IRFA need. Uh, what we want to do is accelerate development and increase the rate of success by reducing risks and costs. So this is um, something that um, has been under contract with the, with the DOD Secretary of Defense's office uh, for the last three years. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, uh, SBIRs, and um, this is dual use. So we were actually funded um, halfway through our phase two with the phase three contract. And uh, specifically, it's for um, burning down risks, business risks, as well as developmental risks that we have along the way to accelerate growth and specifically to attack the, the value of death. And we're talking about the value of death. It's we're talking about at any TRL level. So it can be from lower TRLs to, to mid range TRL or all the way through transition to the warfighter. We uh, are doing this in a highly guided process. Uh, the USPTO came back and said there is no prior art for, for our concept and the way that we put this together. So this is definitely novel. It uses a novel two-tier power set guidance system, both for the AI agents, the five agents we've built out, as well as for human users. Uh, we have multiple um, uh, project formats that we've built into the platform already. We just rolled this out in July of, of this year. So pretty, pretty new and pretty exciting to get out to folks. Uh, the specific um, Project formats we have are for selection and investment of, of technologies, is matching up what, what's the right technology for the application needs that you have along the way, as well as for developing. We have a separate project model to develop all the way through technology readiness levels until uh, deployment. We have, uh, again, the two tier power set system it is based on um, a top level looking at the product technology, the team stakeholders, and market application. That sets up, the, sets up the top tier. There's multiple video clips here that people can go and see how this all works. Again, the value of death is significant. We get a well over 90% failure rate, and that's failure to get all the way through to the to the warfighter in the end. Um, and so it's not any easier for government or enterprises along the way along these lines. I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but basically we do address all the critical investment and acquisition challenges along the way. We've modeled this on top of the government acquisition cycle in the first place to understand what the government needs in the first place. And then we look at the, those critical mitigation development challenges you have uh, throughout your team as far as bringing the team together, identifying the correct risks, success factors, and evidence you need uh, through a quantif quantified scoring system. The reasons for failure we're attacking are choosing the wrong innovation or mitigation effort in the first place, nowhere limited knowledge here across the organization, failure to identify, identify red flags early on, and those human things, uh, making choices that are subjective and biased. Uh, we all do that, so it's, it's making things much more objective and quantitative. And again, this is about decision guidance along the way. So this is the power set. This is what the patent office came back and said, this is completely novel. It's a two-tier mathematical uh, power set guidance system that works both for the AI agents we have, the five agents we've built out, as well as for the human team that you have. So I actually recommend anybody that's developing advanced technology right now, take a look at 9 High. It's going to help you with guidance. It's going to help you understand what your application needs are within the government, what you're trying to accomplish, and those risks and, and objectives you're going to have along the way. It's a very good structured platform that I've been using since 1999. Um, so again, these are various use cases and the different agents that we've built out. Um, we have four different sources of data, which is important for us. So one, we actually tease very good information out of the subject matter expert team that we have. Um, then we have internal vetted databases, and we're also using GPT 3.5. It's interesting that the more advanced versions of GPT don't work as well because it tries to give you a perfect answer, and we don't want that. We want people to be thinking about um, the various um, options that they have along the way. So right now working with the third option here, which is through the public internet. And as we deploy to the government, um, like I said, we're deployed now in the commercial cloud. We're not deployed on the gov cloud yet. We will be doing that in the next 10 months. And then we'll be pointing this, our AI agents toward the government database. The takeaways that I'd like to have is this quantitative. You can see very quickly the health status and the maturity of the technology that you have. Um, to, and we also capture institutional intelligence as well as adversarial intelligence. We think these are all very important aspects that we wanna make sure that um, people understand. 
Uh, we, again, we have three different types of project modules um, that are completely built out. People can use them today. And this is all about managing risks and success. And last thing, we are seeking additional government programs for sponsorship through ATO and, and usage. Thank you very much. Four seconds. Next up is Frank Tanner of Amazon Web Services. All right, everybody. So my name is Frank Tanner. I'm a manager at the AWS Generative AI Innovation Center. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what uh, AWS is thinking about in terms of generative AI. This is my general, you know, what is generative AI chart. I'm not going to go into that since everybody here probably knows what generative AI is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this room. So let me just move on quickly to how AWS is thinking about uh, generative AI. So at a high level, we have four pillars that around unlocking the potential for generative AI. Those pillars are ease of use, cost optimization of the infrastructure, the tooling and services to scale generative AI applications, and the ability to experiment with generative AI all in one location. For the Bengal program, I'm really going to focus and touch upon the ease of use and flexibility aspects of this presentation. So first, let me talk about Amazon Bedrock. Um, in order to leverage and experiment with um, foundation models and generative AI, Amazon has a fully managed service called Bedrock that can accelerate the development of generative AI applications with a single API. Bedrock exposes foundation models from A2I Labs, Anthropic, Stability AI, as well as our Amazon Titan uh, family of foundation models. In minutes, you can begin experimenting with state-of-the-art foundation models via an API or through our Amazon Bedrock um, playgrounds. We also have example notebooks, blog posts, and uh, best practice documentations for interacting with uh, foundation models and prompt engineering and so, so forth. So we have all this information available to you in one place. Uh, Bedrock users can choose from some of the most cutting edge foundation models that are available today. That includes Amazon's Titan foundation models, which are which consist of two new large language models for text summarization, text generation and classification, as well as open ended Q&A uh, for information extraction, embeddings and so forth. Jurassic 2 fam family of multi language L LLMs from A2I labs or AI 21 labs, excuse me. Um, it follows uh, natural language instructions. It can generate text in different languages as well. Um, Anthropic's Claude model can perform a wide variety of conversational and text processing tasks. Um, and you, know, you can benefit from the extensive research that they bring to the table. <coughs> Excuse me. And Cohere's flagship text generation model is trained to follow user commands and be useful instantly. Uh, practical applications such as summarization, copywriting, or question answering. Our Bedrock Managed Service also makes it easy to access Stability AI if you're interested in, in uh, text to image foundation models, um, such as Stable Diffusion, that can generate unique and realistic high quality images. And I know that's of interest for some of the Bengal performers as well. For those customers that want to have uh, create their own foundation models, Amazon SageMaker provides managed infrastructure and tooling to accelerate the reliable and secure model building, training, and deployment of foundation models at scale. Jumpstart offers machine learning practitioners deep model customization and evaluation capabilities with access to foundation models through environments that you already use <coughs> as part of the AWS cloud, such as uh, SageMaker Studio, SageMaker SDK, as well as the SageMaker console. And importantly for this organization, we add new foundation models on a weekly basis. Since this is a lightning talk, this is gonna be my final chart. I just wanna give you a few takeaway items here for uh, any potential Bengal performers. AWS provides a fully managed service bedrock that provides easy API access to many of the latest foundation models. You can get started using bedrock in minutes and AWS provides playgrounds to work with and interface with foundation models right from your own account. For those uh, users that are not on Bedrock or performers that need more flexibility than a managed service that can provide, Amazon SageMaker has a majority of the latest foundation models available that you can instantiate and run in your own AWS account rather than spend half your budget standing up your own uh, foundation model and getting it to run on your own uh, GPU clusters. You can just use the AWS managed services or the Amazon infrastructure to work with and interface with your foundation models in your own account. Importantly, any data that's in your account stays in your account. So we pride ourselves on model security and data security inside of uh, the foundation models and inside of fine tuning these uh, models at scale. So, you know, it, the takeaway message is we have this infrastructure, 
uh, use it. It'll help you accelerate your um, experimentation with, on the Bengal program. So with that, I got 14 seconds to spare. So if you want to discuss anything with me, my email is AI Frank. I, I got that from Amazon. So AI Frank at Amazon.com. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is owner Savas of Blue Halo. Hello, good morning. I'm owner Savas. I'm a senior principal scientist at Blue Halo. A uh, quick overview of our company, our Blue Halo. Uh, Blue Halo is purpose built to provide industry leading capabilities in various uh, domains, mission, and technology domains, including directed energy missile defense, C4ISR. Uh, but for the purposes of this program, the group that's interested in falls under multi uh, autonomy and AI ML mission. Uh, technology and mission set. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over e our expertise and experience. I'm going to start with the right side first. Uh, we have um, a significant um, amount of work going on with both uh, IARPA and other research agencies. We have an established record of uh, research and development and transition. Uh, our current ongoing programs, uh, five IARPA uh, programs ongoing, Smart Riva, Sintra including, uh, Smart is just starting. Uh, one program that involves LLMs, uh, actually creating uh, text uh, with different characteristics, is funded by ONR uh, for counter information warfare. And uh, one uh, program that involves significant amount of NLP, which also involves LLMs from CDAO mission analytics. Uh, prior programs include uh, OST ONR data the decisions, uh, NASA trusted data analytics, and various SPARs regarding GANs and ML and security. We also have an analytics software, scroll.com, uh, which focuses on, uh, you know, uh, not just NLP, but other uh, AI and ML analytics, uh, which uh, digest most of social media data, but other types of data as well. And on the left, uh, various expertise, uh, significant expertise and workforce in AI ML. Uh, multilingual NLP and LG and LU. Uh, we're building specialized LLMs for uh, various mission sets for customers in DOD IC. Uh, we have a good uh, data collection uh, uh, um, module that's able to collect uh, millions uh, of posts per day, uh, setting up MLOps, DevSecOps in our, um, you know, in a, on our uh, GPU cluster. Uh, we have a GPU cluster that consists of eight times six uh, A100 A GPS, which allows us to be able to, you know, fine tune uh, and experiment and actually deploy models. So um, we are not entirely sure if IRP is going to provide a data test bed to be able to fine tune models, but uh, we'll be bringing it to the program if needed. Uh, again, uh, elaborating on our expertise and experience. Uh, on the top left, uh, our core capability is relevant to Bengalis. Uh, we do a lot of mission relevant NLG and NLP uh, applied uh, mostly uh, in the domains of OSINT, SIGINT, DOMEX uh, that utilizes both LLMs and traditional NLPs. Uh, we're focused on uh, multi domain, multilingual data collection. Uh, it's large uh, scale multilingual data collection from social media, RSS feeds, uh, academic documents, websites, and recently, and uh, getting more important audio and video text, uh, et cetera. Uh, adversarial machine learning, machine learning security and privacy for machine analytics. Uh, we have been able to transition various R&D programs into high TRL, uh, technology readiness level solutions to both DOD and IC clients, uh, and elaborating on uh, our capabilities relevant to Bengal. Again, uh, NLP and NLG relevant mission domain expertise, uh, specialized LLM models for mission, uh, creating long and short form data te uh, text, you know, relevant to the counter information warfare program I previously mentioned. Uh, we have an in house air gapped GPU cluster, air gapped in the sense that it can be disconnected from internet completely. Uh, it's very powerful. We have uh, demonstrated being able to find in really big models, uh, such as like 70 million mm -hmm. models. Thank you. Uh, and uh, ML security and privacy for AI, ML multimodal data. Uh, I guess I'm going to say it once more again, track record of transitioning from basic research to high TRL 7 plus solution. Uh, for those who don't know what TRL is like, it's deployed in the field and being used by uh, mission. Uh, so the, the types of teaming relationships sold for Bengal, uh, we haven't been able to elaborate it because we have written it before the technical description release. So I'm just going to keep it uh, generic. Uh, we are looking for potential uh, collaboration for Bengal with uh, academic and uh, small business partners. 
uh, and my contact information is there, uh, and I believe these slides are going to be publicly available. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Don Smith from KUs. Hi, um, I'm Don Smith, IT program manager uh, for uh, Cayuse Technologies. We're a tribally owned 8A company owned by the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Pendleton, Oregon. We have about 600 staff currently working on 55 federal contracts, including uh, AI and data analytics work we're doing for the Department of the State. Um, right now, we also have um, a facil uh, facilities clearance and we're supporting both military and civilian agencies. Um, we're looking to partner with high level AI researchers uh, here to work on Bengal. Um, what we're looking at in terms of the bias effects is we know, and we're in the, in the data that we're working with the Department of the State, we know that AI is dependent on high quality training data and bias training data amplifies oversight, certain data patterns, and could also lead to the underrepresentation of important data. So what we're using, what our data analysts are using is understanding the role of data quality, okay? Then we're applying rigorous statistical practices to assess data and then we use, uh, we fine tune all that data with human feedback. What we're doing is looking at historic data sets where we know the end results we're running our, our AI, and then we're uh, retroactively determining, is this AI going to function in, in determining future results if it can detect the past results and historic results we're looking for? So we're using uh, bias tools to do that, and we're looking to um, basically proactively catch bias and detect problems early. Um, what we're looking at in terms of like AI and the AI limitations those narrow data sets, right? If you're looking with narrow data sets, you're going to end up with um, uh, anal analysis products, which could be produced that there could be incorrect, inappropriate, even harmful, and that results with the skewed final products, which we don't want. So we're combining generative models with a, 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 a basic level of rules-based systems for better output control. Also, um, utilizing explainable AI to get results to understand the way the AI is thinking. The result is that we're enhancing, um, we enhance data diversity to get better results that we're looking for, and it, we support the ongoing optimization and adaptability of AI. Um, one of the key things that we are working on is um, utilizing those additional data sets to counteract biases and really regularly audit the training data, right? So that we've got, we've got working AI systems that we're auditing and auditing to to continue to develop you know newer and more functional ones we have sme analysts that are currently um, choosing those data sources and then adding adding new data sources to widen the creative bounds of the of the government data that we're looking at um, we're we're testing in controlled real world environments specifically on historic data and uh, utilizing these rules-based systems to get us the results we want um, but basically, we are here to partner with you. We have um, a great experience working with the federal government in a wide variety of ways. Um, we have high level data scientists. We have a, a, a facility security clearance and we've got the experience to um, to coordinate. Um, so we'd like to work with research organizations uh, that may be new to supporting the federal government. We have great experience doing so. Um, so I think I'm just going to close in, in saying, as a tri uh, Native American tribally owned company, we have a special relationship under different aspects of the FAR, uh, where we can be awarded up to $100 million of, of unprotestable uh, work with DOD, $25 million with civilian agencies. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Gongbo Zhang of Columbia University. Hello, everybody. My name is Gong Bojang. I'm a postdoc from Columbia University Medical Center, uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics. I work with Dr. Chun Hua Long on medical evidence summarization. So, okay. So, um, the primary goal of evidence based medicine is to improve the out healthcare outcomes by integrating patient values, clinical expertise, and the best available evidence. And one widely used approach for obtaining such evidence is through the systematic review of clinical trials. Since 2020, there have been over 130,000 clinical trials registered at this 
in database. And a recent study pointed out that the average time dedicated on conducting a review is 67 weeks. So all of these factors clearly indicate that systematic review is a very labor intensive process. And to make things even more complicated, um, clinical trials have their own limitations, including cost constraints, ethical considerations, difficulties of recruiting not patients in rare disease studies. So uh, observational data has also been explored as an alternative source of evidence. And as you can see in this pyramid of level evidence, um, observational data has an even larger volume than clinical trials. So we need something scalable, efficient, and trustworthy to sustain the medical, medical evidence summarization task. Okay. So a systematic review is a process of searching, collecting, screening, appraising, synthesizing, and summarizing information sources for, of evidence. And uh, recently, large language models exemplified by ChatGPT and uh, others have been explored on summarizing clinical trials and the meta-analysis. And even before the era of large language models, AI methods have been studied on identifying articles on a given topic or um, extracting evidential description from pub, uh, biomedical publications. But this is not good enough. Uh, evidence summarization remains a challenging task. We recently compiled our concerns into a list of challenges and uh, some pers our perspective on the future directions. For the sake of time, I will just take one talk one example. So hallucination is one well-known problem. There has been some recent efforts towards retrieval augmented generation. Instead of producing the problem completion directly, it provides a list of references supporting this claim. But this is not good enough in evidence-based medicine. That is because now the clinical trials or the references may not inherently agree with uh, the results of the meta-analysis. Some of the references or clinical trials are considered as high risk of bias. Some of them are not conducted following um, the design protocol. So this is just one example of the complexity of our task. Uh, while we focus on this domestic specific application, we believe that um, some of the principles may be applied to other domains as well. And uh, yeah. Uh, we have some uh, ongoing project um, Earlier this year, we have a pilot study benchmarking GPT 3.5 and 4 on summarizing meta results of meta analysis. And the good news is we see the potential of large language models. And bad news is we see some limitations. And uh, there's still a lot of work needs to be done. We have an ongoing project seeing how much, to what degree, these large language models can be further improved via the fine tuning mechanism. We have a long tradition of sharing our findings with the community. You can find us in NPJ Digital Medicine. You can find us in JBI, JBI Jamie, and other venues. Last but not least, I want to thank uh, the funding agency that have already supported our previous studies, and uh, I want to thank all the collaborators. I want. I looking forward to team up with you, on our future endeavor. And uh, thank you very much. Next up is Arthur Paul Peterson of City University of New York. Greetings. Um, I am Arthur Paul Peterson uh, with the Department of Computer Science at City University of New York, City College, and the CUNY Remote Sensing Earth Systems Institute, or the CUNY Quest Institute. I'd like to introduce you to a talented group of researchers eager to contribute to advancing Bengal's goals. Sam Alexander with the Quantitative Analytics Unit with the U.S. Securities and National, uh, excuse me, and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Uh, James Krill and Mike Marciano with the Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute at Syracuse University, along with David Kellen of uh, the Department of Psychology, also at Syracuse University. Clint Davis Stobert with the Department of Psychological Sciences at the University of Missouri, and Michael Grossberg, Rosario Gennaro, and Akira Kawaguchi, uh, my colleagues in the Department of Computer Science at the City University of New York. Um, before you is a seasoned cross-disciplinary research group, uh, a cooperative, um, whose work spans theory and practice. Um, you are invited to contact me to learn more about our capabilities. Visit ArthurPaulPeterson.org for more information. Um, I'd be happy to send you a capabilities summary. Um, real problems do not know disciplinary boundaries. You have, we have a passion for developing methods and insights from across disciplines to cut through real problems to deliver clear solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Dartmouth University, Yao Chin Yang. 
Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yao Ching Yang, and I'm currently an assistant professor at uh, Dartmouth University. Uh, so this talk is about novel threat modes in large language model, uh, model attacks and uh, failure modes in large language model defenses. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this talk. So I'll talk about three objectives. Uh, the first two about novel threat modes, and the third one is about a defense scheme. Uh, so these are related to my prior work so that you can get, get a sense of what I have been working on. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk with you during the proposal day. Um, so let's focus on the first one. So the first one is about the durable backdoor attacks on large language models. Uh, backdoor attacks have been extensively studied. And the difference between our work and uh, uh, the other works is that we consider the durability of backdoors. So the backdoor attacks like uh, you can um, use some poison updates to implant so-called backdoors into the large language model. And then the test time, uh, the model's output can then be fixed to some given target for certain inputs. So this could be used to generate some toxic text targeted at a certain group of people. Um, and why is the durability important in this context? Well, uh, it's because large language models are often fine-tuned before using. So if the attack is not durable, then it will be easily erased um, during further training. So we show that in a baseline attack, um, uh, basically the backdoor is just not durable at all. After several rounds of further training, it is erased. However, uh, using a one very simple technique, you can just change this and increase the durability by a maximum of five X. Okay, so the second objective uh, is about a novel threat mode. Um, it's about how to teach large language models to fish secure information. This is a novel attack scheme to extract the private information from large language models, and it's a three-phase attack. So during the first phase, um, the adversaries will teach the large language models to fish by inserting some benign appearing poisons. So basically, the adversaries are trying to teach the large language model become experts in extracting secure information. And then in the second phase, the model memorizes secret because it was taught to fish, right? So this could be because some large language model corporations use this uh, interaction data to uh, fine tune these large language models. Um, and then um, during the third phase, the attackers will prompt the large language model to generate some secret. We show that if you don't have the first phase, then the success rate of extracting a secret is zero, okay? So there is no way that you can extract it. However, if you have the first phase, then the success rate can be boosted to 80%. And more importantly, when the size of the model increases, um, the success rate of the attack increases as well. So this is actually a threat mode for large language models. Okay, in the final, um, Right, I will talk about uh, large language model defense and we'll propose an analytical framework based on model diagnostics. And the goal here is to utilize variant training quality to design a divine and conquer defense. So in the past, I studied phase transitions in deep learning. So this is very similar to phase transitions in physics. So we show that there exists uh, different types of loss landscapes, good loss landscapes and bad optimization loss landscapes. And then you can actually utilize this thing to analyze several rounds of the Trojai data, which is also a project run by RPAR. So the main idea here is that based on the structure of the loss landscape, the best way to train these neural networks or to process these neural networks are different. So we extended this to uh, the failure mode study of AI models. So if a failure happens, maybe it comes from data or comes from uh, model architecture, or comes from insufficient hyperparameter tuning. Okay, so this can be uh, applied to the study of large language model defenses as well. So if a failure happens, we want to figure out the source of the failure, and that is the main goal of this project. Okay, uh, that is all. Thank you, and I hope I have a chance to talk with you during the proposal day. Thank you. Next up is Zadie Ortiz of Data Crunch Lab. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Zadie Ortiz, and I am the CEO of Data Crunch Lab. We are new to IARPA, but not to the intelligence community. Uh, this summer, I had the opportunity to participate in the 2023 Summer Conference on Applied Data Science that is hosted at the Laboratory of Analytic uh, Sciences 
that the lab was established at NC State University with uh, collaboration from NSA. And it looked at uh, the, the summer conference, uh, looked to develop a tailored daily report. It is kind of like the president's daily brief, but uh, for everyone in the intelligence community and, and for um, every person. So the, the idea is that uh, every day you would get uh, all of your documents, documents, summarize them. And for us, uh, our goal that during the summer was to develop a verification methodology to determine if there was hallucinations or factual consistency problems uh, such that we could edit the summary and then deliver a quality TLDR. You can ask me about the summer conference later. They are actually recruiting for the next year. So during the summer conference, we evaluated uh, various methods to determine the factual consistency of the summaries. Again, I, I mentioned hallucinations, but there's more to factual consistency errors. And uh, we see that we uh, evaluated against the gold standard human evaluation and uh, see that the metrics that are already in uh, published are capturing the errors, but not all of them. So there's uh, more uh, research that's needed for, for capturing that. We also experimented uh, with improving the detection of hallucinations uh, with an ensemble of metrics. And we saw that combining multiple methods definitely uh, improved on the detection and the LLMs as an evaluator also helped with that. And um, we experimented with different temperatures of an LLM to, to be able to do better detection and an ensemble of that. And then last but not least, we demonstrated the feasibility of improving the factual consistency of the summary by refining them uh, with, with LLMs. Um, our team is, uh, has a history of innovation. We are highlighting our software, software development capability, where a few years ago we developed a digital assistant and pioneered the use of conversational AI in, in that area um, in manufacturing to talk to your data. And today it seems like, oh, of course, uh, but, but back then uh, it was a new and uh, emerging technology. So again, we are a small business in the area. We have, capabil we, we have capabilities in the areas of LLM research and um, explainable AI as well as software development. And we're looking to partner with uh, organizations that may have uh, linguistics, computational, so social science, and potentially human computer interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Benjamin Bell of EduWorks. Thank you, Pete. Good morning. I'm Ben Bell from EduWorks. I'll tell you a little bit about our company and the work that we're doing that's relevant to Bengal. Uh, we're a small business. We've been around for over 20 years. Our core capabilities have been in AI and machine learning and now um, LLMs. I'll tell you a little bit about that. We have focused mainly on U.S. government clients, principally in the DOD, but with some recent relevant work for the National Science Foundation, for Homeland, and for elements of the IC. We have, um, you know, it's funny, significant experience LLMs that have been around for like nine minutes, but we do have some experience in LLMs. Um, we have a longer track record for building um, AI for not only DARPA, but other um, government customers, and currently working on LLM bias for the National Science Foundation. Our goals for this project is to uh, support analysts by helping to rapidly contextualize information and move from data to actionable insights, um, at the same time avoiding the kind of biases that you've heard about this morning. Um, from some of the other work that we've been doing, we want to uh, synthesize uh, novel approaches to address the vulnerabilities that this project is focused on. So these are threats that a lot of you are already familiar with, and through our other work, we are looking at both injection and inference attacks. Uh, these are hard to detect. Um, generally, you need people in the loop, and uh, if they're good people, they can do good um, detection, but that's an approach that doesn't scale and it's prone to error. Another problem is that there are applications that you can envision of the outcomes of this program that would be looking at 
threats from um, places that aren't the US or aren't the West. And so if the LLMs are trained on models that have biases to US and Western data, that could undermine their utility in those sorts of applications. And finally, hallucinations that you've uh, heard about this morning and you're familiar with come up with problems that look, I mean, solution answers that look kind of okay, but they're just completely fabricated. Currently, we're working with uh, DARPA. We have been since 2017 under a uh, SBIR project that Edgeworks leads. We're also on the, we're also a teammate on Semaphore. But in our uh, work for DARPA, we're building a machine learning platform that can detect GAN generated deep fake human speech in real time. We're currently developing a dashboard that supports analysts with not only determining yes or no, this sample is authentic or deep fake, but um, what are the other attributes and what does that tell the analyst about the intentions of the adversary in launching that deep fake attack in the first place? So this work will give analysts better uh, visibility um, into the adversary intent than kind of legacy techniques. Um, we're adding not only the deep fake detection, but localization of that tampering within the uh, signal, speaker diarization diarization, and person of interest, uh, and then automated topic extraction and language identification. For the National Science Foundation, we're working on safe large language models. Edgeworks is leading a project called SkillSync. SkillSync itself is really about aligning automatically uh, desired skills with um, for employers and then the skills that are available in the workforce. But a major part of this effort is bias mitigation. So uh, we're pre-training language models that uh, inject language mitigation and bias measurements at each step along the model design process. We not only detect and measure bias, but also have uh, remedies that can replace bias terms with, with semantically equivalent terms that are, um, are more neutral. Thanks, Pete. So through the work that we've been doing for other government customers, uh, we are synthesizing an approach that will help dramatically reduce hallucination, but in a way that uh, uses our streamlined machine learning pipeline to minimize not only the cost of retraining models, but the need for retraining models, in part by providing the models with access to uh, real-time data and the ability to integrate into customer infrastructures. Uh, look forward to uh, teaming discussions today, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next up is Peter Chu of Galisteo. Thanks. Yes, so I'm the president of uh, Galisteo Consulting Group. We're a very small company. I have literally three employees. We're based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit about what we've been working on, and hopefully you'll want to um, engage with us. So I'm going to tell you about my background. So I, I come from the background originally of ling uh, language and linguistics, language and literature, in fact, humanities. Um, Russian and Polish, my two languages. Um, that's going to come up. Um, because I, I actually spent a year living in the Soviet Union, um, so I kind of got used to the thinking of, of Russians. And I, I feel, feel like that's going to be an important part of this, because we're looking at adversarial um, thinking and how that can influence large language models. My doctoral thesis was in computational linguistics. I've focused a lot on multilingual NLP. I've also spent a lot of time thinking about disinformation, how to counter that and how to create generalized applications. In other words, something that isn't tailor-made just for one problem, but generalizes to many different problems. Uh, happens to be a fraud investigator as well. And I, a, number of, a, number of the, um, a number of things that we've done have been um, reduced practice and you know, now patents. And finally, I have both industry and government experience. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, what I think is a good versus bad um, role for NLP. What I don't like to see and what I feel like we, we do too much is we bundle a lot of stuff into a black box, which becomes unexplainable. Um, what I think is the proper role is for the analyst to have his or her proper role in, the, in this, for the black block box to be quite, kind of small, to do uh, what computation does well, but then leave to the analyst what the analyst does well. Too often I feel like we try to usurp the analyst's role. So let me talk a little bit about what I think the applications are to Bengal. And I, I think now having seen the 
the um, technical description. I think the applications here are going to be mostly in topic one and topic four. So that's the uh, induction of diverse analytical perspectives and the working resiliently with uh, potentially poisoned sources. So we had a book come out this year, which you're welcome, excuse the shameless plug, but you're welcome to read the book. It gives a lot of our perspective on how NLP should be used, in my opinion, for the um, intelligence community. Um, and a lot of this is about summarization and contextualization of um, information which may be in other languages. Secondly, what IOPA wants is a means of identifying and mitigating hazardous use of LLMs by potentially adversaries. So just recently, I've spent some time thinking about basically how, to, how do we break things like ChatGPT. So the idea here basically is to pose the same question to ChatGPT in two different languages, like, you know, is Russia's U Ukraine invasion justified? Ask it that same question in English and then in Russian and look what the differences are. So it's sort of like trying to break it, trying to see what, what comes out at the other end and what can we learn from that about what the biases may be. Um, a lot of the thinking here actually comes from, again, my, my time spent living in Russia and sort of trying to get inside an adversary's head. So this is General Gerasimov here. He talks about information spaces. And so my idea here is basically, let's assume he can actually, you know, influence the Russian speaking inf information space. Well, what can we learn from that? Um, so the idea is really to combine that adversary thinking with state of the art data analytics to basically sort of, you know, beat the adversary at his own game. So as far as Bengal is concerned, we are interested in being a sub or consultant. Like I said, we're a very small firm. Uh, we have been both prime and sub to the US government before. We do have clearances. I know this is all unclassified. Um, here are a list of some of the agencies that we work with. I also have work, um, industry experience as well, and our company does too. So please reach out. I will be here all day. You can catch me at lunch break or after the end of, you know, when we have the proposer discussions, teaming discussions. Thanks for your attention. Look forward to talking with you. Thank you. Our next three presenters will be presenting uh, via the WebEx. And the first one is Gabrielle Angeloro of Geometric Data Analysis. Thank you. Um, shall I share myself? If you can, yes, please do. Okay. Um, thanks. Yeah, my name is Gabrielle Angeloro, and I will introduce the topic of topological parallax shape analytics for the explainability of LLMs presented by geometric data analytics. At GDA, we're really interested in the phenomenon of hallucinations, that is the fabrication of information which is not based in fact. And this idea is illustrated in a query from the New York Times to Microsoft's Bing asking, when did the New York Times first report on artificial intelligence? Bing explains that the first mention of AI was in a review by the New York Times on a book called The Human Use of Human Beings. And the answer that Bing gives is wrong in a couple of interesting ways. Firstly, the month and day Bing cites on which the review was published is wrong only one day earlier than its true published date. Further, the year is wrong, but is actually the true date in which the New York Times reviewed another work from the same author. Um, the author is attributed to the wrong John, and Bing ends its answer with a manufactured URL that has never existed. And the closeness of Bing's answer to the truth is not by accident. The language model has been trained on lots of information which is similar to the content of the query, and the answer is optimizing the likelihood that the text in the answer would follow the text in the question. And this is highlighting a problem of objective misalignment. Our objective for a language model is to give information that is factual. However, the objective of the language model is only to produce the most probable next bit of text. And often these goals align, but when they do not, the model may give false information. To increase the safety of the use of LLMs, we need to better understand when hallucinations occur. Our tool, Topological Parallax, which is recently accepted in NeurIPS, gives information about what regions and scales hallucinations are likely to occur. 
To begin to interrogate the LLM, we must look at the data in which it was used to train on. Um, and this data set contains 20 news groups, each containing about 18,000 posts. Um, we view the phrases as points in a vector space. And in this particular embedding, we can see posts from similar groups that are clustered together. And at GDA, we analyze these word embeddings with shape analytics to give us information of the data within, the geometry of the data within and between these news groups. And to do so, we use the tools of topological data analysis. Topological data analysis gives us information about multi-scale geometry. In this small example, there are 12 local circles, each of which form one global circle. And all of this geometry and everything in between is captured in shape analytics. These tools are also parameter free. And so since no choices are being made, this analysis gives us more honest information about the data and therefore may hallu where hallucinations may occur. So when can we say if the LLM is hallucinating? Uh, we propose an experiment with question answer pairs, some of which the answers are correct and some of which are fabrications. So imagine a scenario in which timekeeping of the whereabouts of personnel is automated. Suppose a soldier left the base on Monday, was absent for the week, and came back on Friday. But the database shows five days of work for that week. The query asks the language model how to remedy the database to eliminate inconsistency. A correct answer may point out that the soldier forgot to clock out and would modify the timesheet appropriately. But an incorrect answer may yes. advise the system to, um, to drop the soldier completely from the database. So our solution, topological data, um, topological parallax identifies the scales and regions at which it's safe to interpolate across. Um, and when the user queries the model with a question which lies outside of the verified region, the answer cannot be trusted and may contain a hallucination. Um, the user would be alerted of this information and warned. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Svetlana Volkova of Aptima. Hey everyone, and I would appreciate if you can help me to share my screen. Thank you. So my name is Dr. Svetlana Volkova, and I am a chief AI scientist within the Office of Science and Technology at Aptima. Next slide. Aptima is a small business. We were founded in 1995, and we have experts in cognitive and behavioral sciences, NIML data science and software engineering. And we develop capabilities that bridge the gaps between people, technologies, and complex operational environments. Um, and we have been supporting the army for more than 26 years and, and um, uh, DOD in general. Next slide. So today I'm gonna tell you about um, Optima's capabilities in AML evaluation in general, and then talk about this paradigm shift when now we need to evaluate emerging and, and AI behaviors, um, as well as cover capabilities uh, in human AI integration and trust and talk about causal discovery and reasoning. So the, the first I wanted to highlight is that my team developed um, LLMs from scratch, from, from scratch um, uh, focusing on text, um, which are LLMs and other types of foundation models, uh, ranging from cyber data to chemistry data. Next slide. And in general, at Optima, we're focusing on developing technology um, uh, for measuring and optimizing human AI and integrated human AI performance. Next slide. Um, in general, for AI ML evaluation, uh, we have been developing uh, metrics and benchmarks and um, in both interactive and static approaches to evaluate um, uh, model behavior ranging from out of distribution evaluation, um, repeated evaluations using the state-of-the-art models and baselines, and currently we're serving as the test and evaluation team on DARPA Semaphore and DARPA Assist programs. Next slide. Uh, in addition to that, we developed novel interactive capabilities that specifically go beyond F1 score and, and accuracy measures and focus on model accountability, reliability, robustness, and transparency. And these are a few examples of recently published work um, which represent uh, different metrics and interactive evaluation tools that could be leveraged for this effort too. Next slide. Um, 
but right now we li we all live in this era when when we need to um bring the evaluation to a different level and um, start evaluating emerging model behaviors specifically focusing on llms and what optima has been developing is going beyond the rant teaming and focusing on violet teaming, which is which also involves thinking about model um, um, a responsible way that we develop these models, and we have been developing capabilities that um, merge a data and metrics and in different ways of deploying, developing, deploying, and rigorously evaluating LLM specifically and other types of foundation models, um, um, running a lot of experiments with different set of prompts and applying different types of metrics that range from core metrics, core trustworthy AI metrics to different cognitive framing effect metrics, um, and also measuring the um, um, performance of LLM specifically on downstream tasks. We also have the ability of leveraging human AI interaction data uh, and, um, and, and more. Next slide. Um, so uh, this is just one example of different types of effects and different types of attacks that we have been looking into. Next slide. Um, and in addition to that, as I said, leveraging the human AI interaction data, and we have expertise in that. This is just a few tools that we have been developing for our uh, customers that range from different cognitive sidekicks to the calibration of trust tools. Next slide. And finally, causal discovery and reasoning um, technologies developed by Optima and, and published can be leveraged to really understand the cause and effect of different prompting techniques um, and different effects on model behavior. Um, next slide. And that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Alex Carrera of Carnegie Mellon University. All right. Hopefully you guys can hear me and see my screen. We can see your screen. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Cabrera. I'm a PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm going to be talking about our platform called Xeno today. Um, we're a pretty strong inter interdisciplinary team at Carnegie Mellon. Um, we span language technologies, machine learning, and human computer interaction. Um, some people on our team were some of the first people to work with prompt engineering, um, do some work on federated learning, and automatically discovering errors in, in machine learning models. Um, and we have a very strong background in HCI, especially from the cybersecurity space that we're bringing over into machine learning evaluation and testing. Um, so just a brief overview of kind of where we're at with evaluation today for these models. Uh, a lot of work has focused on creating these big evaluation benchmark sets or relying on human feedback um, or even asking models themselves to generate data to do evaluation. Um, in the end of the day, what these methods provide are these large evaluation sets. Um, there are tons of these for any type of domain, whether you're looking at audio transcription or uh, text summarization, but these are almost always reduced into a single aggregate metric, say accuracy or something like word error rate. Um, if you look at any of kind of the standard ways of evaluating or comparing models, they're always reduced to these single metrics, um, which are honestly very limited. If you look at a real example that a couple of people today have already mentioned, like text summarization, um, there are a bunch of questions that you might ask that are impossible to answer with a single metric. Um, maybe more m normal things like, hey, are, is the summary grammatically correct or does it work for long text? Or more pernicious things like, is it leaking sensitive information? Um, is it, does it have lies or is it um, maybe not even a useful summary at all? Uh, and I think that the TLDR is that these singular aggregate metrics are really insufficient to answer the important questions we care about and identify these limitations, failures, and potential threats. And our, our takeaway is that we really need powerful interfaces um, that are powered by intelligent features to help people really discover and take away the interesting insights from these evaluation sets to understand the complex behavior of generative AI. So we've been building this, this large platform called Xeno that combines kind of intelligent failure analysis, um, empowering people to use their own domain knowledges, domain knowledge, but also supported by intelligent features to discover potential errors, threats in their models, um, and moving towards these interactive reports that are grounded in the data, um, that are reactive and can update live with new data and new models, and can also be reproduced. Um, so I encourage you to go to, to our homepage if you want to explore some of these projects and reports. Um, we've done things like looking at audio transcription and biases across accents. We've done evaluation on stable diffusion models, looking at 2 million images to find um, biases across different genders and types of prompts. 
Um, and we've looked even at web agents, LLM agents that are interacting with the web and how they can kind of go out of control, maybe start repeating things and, and kind of actually cause harm when, when released into the wild. Um, so just very briefly, the two areas that we're focusing on, one is this intelligent error analysis. The idea is to empower users to use their own domain knowledge to quickly quantify specific behaviors, potential demographic biases, potential hallucinations and models, scaffolded and helped by automatic, automated discovery. So this is automatically discovering slices of data using the embeddings or the projection of the model to discover clusters with high error potential behaviors. Um, and the idea is to let people bubble that up into these data-driven reports that are reproducible, that can be used across different models, and that can be updated live as new model versions come out or new data comes in. Um, so we kind of scaffold the whole process from the initial discovery of model errors and model limitations to these interactive data-driven reports, all supported um, by smart intelligent tools that kind of guide you in the right direction. So that's a very quick, brief overview. We're always looking for new partners to, to um, implement new data sets, look at new data using Xena, um, and always looking for new techniques to, to implement in the platform. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's time for the afternoon lightning talk session. Our first talk is Dustin Danhauer of Go Charlie. Thank you. So I am a uh, AI research scientist at Go Charlie AI. We are a full stack generative AI company developing intelligent assistant. Uh, that's our logo. Uh, so we are building uh, agents that can take complex tasks in, with a single prompt. So this is an example of something we would do in the intelligence community. I will just say first, so our current product is built more towards marketing uh, right now. So individuals and businesses that do marketing on social media, but we are building, we have a modular based system. We're constantly innovating and adding new tools and new APIs and uh, expanding to more and more domains. Uh, and so something that is akin to what the, you know, an intelligence community task might be is uh, this prompt that's given by the user here at the top, search social media posts in city center, categorize posts by threat type, physical, electronic, and persuasion, then rank each threat and provide two actionable steps to reduce the threat. By the way, use the attached file report on nearby state adversaries goals to predict which adversary is behind each threat and explain why. So this basically gets fed in. We generate a short plan to execute these tasks and then we have a number of components shown in these white boxes, uh, including our own LLMs that we use in-house when it's appropriate, um, and also APIs shown on the, in the pink box here. And so some of these are more for, you know, right now shown more for content generation um, with, you know, in a marketing space, but you can imagine uh, adding, you know, more relevant tools. And then once uh, these basically run and execute, we also have some plan execution monitoring techniques to see, you know, in case a tool fails, and then we bring that all together uh, back to a report and answer for the user. So uh, companies and uh, government agencies have uh, their own knowledge bases. And so the way that our agent is designed is that it can attach to pre-existing knowledge base. And so we can take documents in a lot of different uh, forms uh, and basically use that with our agent to accomplish a uh, variety of tasks, so on the which are shown on the right here. So create and repurpose our big use cases in marketing domains, but in the intelligence community, um, this would be more for analysis and, and research. And then within, uh, when it comes to LLMs, so we offer a foundational LLMs and fine tuning. So when there's uh, not as many resources to train, to like retrain or fine tune a large LLM. Uh, one approach that we have is adapter based fine tuning, which essentially adds a few million parameters to the attention layers. Uh, and then we fine tune on that. Um, when we have a lot more data points and maybe also com computational resources, we can also do full model fine tuning, which does lead to, to higher quality results. And then finally, our team uh, has nearly 10 years of, of uh, experience going after government funded work. Um, I've been involved with a, a few DARPA projects myself. Um, so Costa Hitalis is uh, really an expert in, in multimodal models. Despina 
leads the data pipelines and model optimization. And she is all, we're actively investigating things right now for what we are calling AI safeguards to build into our agent, uh, dealing with toxicity, bias, degradation, factuality, uh, and just quality. Uh, and then I myself, my background is more in cognitive architectures, uh, planning, execution, monitoring, even metacognition. And so how do you get really robust agent behavior when you're doing di diverse tasks? Um, and so what I will say, so we're a smaller team of less than 10 people. So we are more interested in being a subcontractor uh, teammate. We do have experience with all aspects of the, uh, you know, uh, process of, you know, helping to write proposals and then, of course, executing the work. Um, so I will also say that we are particularly interested in uh, we, one one topic that we're interested in is is also topic number one, the subtopic on analyst blind spots. We have a, uh, a, you know, a case where our users don't always even know how to prompt the system properly to get the answer they want. And so there's some overlap there. And so we've started to look into that problem as well. But if you're at all interested, please reach out to me. My email is Dustin at GoCharlieAI. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Rush of Griffin Scientific. Hi, my name is Meg Rush and I am with Griffin Scientific. Uh, Griffin is a small business that consults primarily for the government, but also with private clients. We're known for taking creative and evidence-based approaches to challenging issues and across many domains, including health, safety, and security in the U.S. and abroad. Um, we consult across the, the interagency from ASPR to USDA. And since our founding in 2005, we have um, really maintained a reputation for scientific rigor and analytic excellence. Um, to highlight a few of our areas of expertise that are particularly relevant today, you know, we're recognized uh, in both by both the US government and industry as an expert in LLM threat modes, uh, especially at the intersection with vulnerabilities in biological science and infrastructure protection. We've uh, worked to develop tools um, for threat detection and mitigation. Um, and we have worked also at deploying LLMs with bias mitigation and sourcing. So um, I'm gonna walk quickly through two examples of work that we've done. Um, in an exam this example, we developed a system called SUMO with an SBIR from the NIH, which specifically uh, is a digital toolbox to help identify vaccine mis misinformation and um, then use a highly curated knowledge base to provide um, counterfactuals with the, the current um, science. And, um, you know, for this, we developed automated Twitter scraping tools and um, were able to extract, extract and store information related to COVID, influenza, and other vaccine-related tweets. And then we used a deep learning classifier to identify tweets as misinformation. Following that, um, we have our knowledge base, which was developed from about 3,500 publications from recognized domain experts, which we translated into machine readable files and developed into a ve vector database that is leveraged to create explanations um, to counter the vaccine information that has been identified. Um, across a suite of projects, we've been working with um, some of the top LLM developers with the US government. Um, at the time the slide was out, we didn't have it public, but the G7 government is the UK government to help them really understand and develop strategies to assess current and future misuse of LLMs, especially when it comes to enabling malicious application of biological um, knowledge. And this information is focused mostly to date on biological based attacks, and it looks at both the risks and the benefits of this technology because it's really important to weigh both sides of that coin. So just a couple of examples of work that we've done in this area. We have developed question and answer panels with our experts to assess and predict the current and future capabilities of LLMs. We've also worked with collaborators um, to explore what extent LLMs can enable ad adversaries with respect to planning and execution of biological attacks. And finally, we've um, helped industry understand where the red lines are, um, where their models might be enabling misuse of biology in a way that um, exceeds the benefits to science and society that the models are providing. So why Griffin? Uh, we bring sophisticated domain expertise in the health, life sciences, and infrastructure protection areas, and that can be used to help develop um, domain-specific threat taxonomies. We have experience developing tools and technologies to identify, characterize, and mitigate LLM threats 
for both government stakeholders and private industry. We have a team of domain experts that are thank you, uh, adept at using um, a wide variety of different LLM models um, and red teaming them. We have technology to assist in identifying misinformation and toxic outputs and to enable source attribution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roy, Zhu, Roy Zhu of, so you, you'll say it, uh, Indiana University. All right, it's Ray. So this is Ray from Indiana University. Oh, sorry. Over the next five minutes, I'm gonna provide a brief overview of our team, as well as an introduction to the LLM related work that we are currently engaged in. So I'm here on behalf of our team, which comprised of faculty members from Indiana University and the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. We have three experts leading our group. Professor Wang specializing in AI security and confidential computing, Professor Tang specializing in AI privacy and bias, and Professor Liu an expert in natural language processing. So currently we are contributing to IRPA's children AI project from 2020 to 2024. We have maintained a pretty good comfort performance in this uh, project. Meanwhile, we have also acted in several AI security and privacy competition in the, this year and last year. So our research primarily focused on LLM security and privacy, as well as uh, LLM bias, toxicity, and personalization. For the bias toxicity aspect, we mainly have two direction. First, we we have integrated LLM with knowledge graph to both manipulate and detect ideological and cognitive bias. And our most recent work focused on how to mitigate these bias and toxicities. In addition to that, we worked on how LLM interact with smaller domain specific models in areas that require a higher degree of sensitivity such as legal AI and healthcare. Our contribution has been recognized in many top tier computer science conferences, including EMLP, SMP, CCS, and et cetera. So one of our publications earned the best paper nomination in CCS 2022. So another direction of our research is around the issue of security and privacy within LLMs. Specifically, on the left hand side, this is a high level idea of our recent study, which has just posted on the archive this week. We investigated in uh, when LLM such as ChatGPT opening the uh, Bantu interface. As earlier research demonstrated that extracting PII from LLM is really hard, even though you could uh, jailbreak ChatGPT, merely none of the extracted PII is correct. So those extracted PII tend to be a hallucination in this case. However, now with the Bantu interface, we can craft a small malicious data set Bantu the LLM. In such way, we can now press precisely uh, extract around 70% of PII from the LLM. On the right hand side, we consider another attack surface of deep learning model in hardware level. We have demonstrated that flipping just a few bits at the memory in the hardware can manipulate the model output. This opens another door for attacker to launch backdoor attack or privacy attack. Uh, and by the way, I'd like to mention that the diagram on the left hand side was created using Dell E3 OpenAI's latest product. Well, it's pretty amazing and demonstrated the capability of pairing large language models with vision models. It's also revealed some inconsistency and vulnerability in the system. For instance, you may notice an individual seemingly standing on water in the middle, which is clearly a wrong thing. We are looking for partner. And so if you have any questions, please contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Ari Chada of IQT Labs. Um, so hi, I'm Ari Chada. I'm a data scientist at IQT Labs. We're part of the capabilities business sorry, at Inkytel. Um, so we work on proxy problems of national security interest in the open source. Um, today I'm gonna talk about one of our projects called uh, an evaluation authority. And so before I dive into this diagram, I'll take a moment to define what an evaluation authority is, because it's a term we came up with. Uh, and so an evaluation authority is a programmatic instantiation of one or more tests maintained by a trusted organization for the purpose of establishing and iterating safety standards and or rankings. And so this work came out of three main ideas, the first of which many of you have echoed today. Uh, we need use case specific quantitative measures for bias, fairness, adversarial robustness, et cetera, when it comes to LOMs. Um, second, these metrics must address Goodhart's law for them to maintain their validity in the long term. 
And then third, in all but the best funded companies, AI tools and systems are iterated on during production without clear understanding of limitations. And so functionally how this works uh, through the infrastructure we've built uh, to take LLMs from Hugging Face or um, your own containerized model and run them, uh, run highly parallelized and scalable tests that are coupled with withheld data sets um, to just Goodhart's law and then aggregate them into what we're calling a red team report or more colloquially consumer reports for AI models to give a clear understanding of limitations. And so to understand this, let's take it in the context of a typical AI model life cycle. And so this is definitely review for this crowd, but uh, I'll give you a moment to glance it over. And so the evaluation authority provides clear value at two stages of this life cycle. First, um, when you're selecting a pre-trained architecture or purchasing a model, it can sort of help you wait um, which might be the best architecture, uh, sorry, trained model for you to choose. Um, and then at the end of the model life cycle, when you're ready to deploy your model into production, you can submit that model back to the evaluation authority and get a clear understanding of the limitations. Uh, I won't go into this slide in too much detail, but we made kind of a concerted effort to use canonical machine learning tools uh, because we we're planning to open source this work uh, alongside our publication at IAAI. And so we're looking for people to come work on building more assessments with us. Uh, and so here's an example of an output report. Um, this report was programmatically generated. You create the template when you um, define a test and then all those numbers are populated by the, the platform that we built out. Um, and so this report is an example of a uh, named entity recognition uh, report and we have a multilingual robustness assessment as a demonstrator in here uh, to sort of show um, how this would work. Uh, and we definitely just focused on the infrastructure side of this problem to start, uh, but our collaborators at the Digital Safety and Research Institute at UL are scaling this up. And so, as I said, we're looking for subject matter experts to contribute uh, assessments. Um, we're also looking for proprietary models to evaluate we can access the open source models through the Hugging Face Hub API, but um, you know, would get a better, uh, more holistic uh, validation of the use of this tool uh, through proprietary models as well. Um, and then looking at additional use cases to write tests for. Uh, and so keep an eye out for our open sourcing of this code alongside our publication at IAAI in February. Uh, and come talk to me, please, if you're interested in collaborating. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sohail Faizi of University of Maryland. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sohail Faizi. I'm an associate uh, professor in the computer science department at University of Maryland. In my group, we are working on different reliability and safety aspects of different AI models, including LLMs. And today I'm going to talk about uh, two topics about LLM safety, including their detection and robustness. Obviously, you all know LLMs can be misused in order to uh, spread propaganda or misinformation or access some sensitive information, for example, instruction on making a homemade explosive. So one way to mitigate these uh, threats is via detecting AI-generated content. There are various techniques in order to uh, tackle this problem using neural networks, watermarking, zero-shot learning methods, information retrieval methods. I won't bore you with the details of uh, these, uh, uh, these methods. So one thing we, uh, we did recently is to evaluate the reliability of these methods against different types of attacks, including one attack that we have developed and we call it recursive paraphrasing. It is a very simple attack, basically recursively paraphrases a passage and uh, looks at the output of your detector and the stability of the output of the detector. So one thing we noticed is these recursive paraphrasing actually doesn't degradate, uh, degradate the quality of the passage that much measured uh, via perplexity score or human evaluation. Right, so uh, these are some results on uh, applying recursive paraphrasing, for example, on watermarking. As you can see, without um, this attack, watermarking is very effective. Uh, it gives you almost 100% detection rate, but after multiple applications of recursive paraphrasing, your detection rate at the 1% false positive rate can drop to as low as 4%. And as I mentioned, the um, quality of the passages, uh, they're pretty good, even after multiple rounds of uh, paraphrasing. Same story for zero-shot based detectors, neural network based detectors, in 
information retrieval based on pictures. We have also shown LLMs can be spoofed. Here you have a real text and you are altering it a little bit adversarially so that the output of your detector will flag these real texts by, uh, by humans as AI generated. So that's called spoofing attack. And we have shown all of these uh, models, they have sensitivity against the spoofing attack. Right, so in the next two and a half minutes, I'll talk about robustness of LLMs against adversarial problems. Right, so we know uh, language models are very useful, but they can uh, uh, pose this risk of uh, having an easy access to sensitive information. But many of these models, they have safeguards in place. So if you go to chat GPT and prompt, you know, give me an instruction of um, homemade explosive or a chemical weapon, probably, you know, you'll get this response saying that I won't be able to assist you. But recently it has been shown that if you add some adversarial prompts to the end of your um, initial prompt, you can get around those safety filters. And then the model is going to be very cooperative with you, provide the details uh, of those sensitive information because those details are in the model. So how these attacks are uh, being developed, basically they're a combination of various greedy and uh, greedy and discrete optimization based methods. And one trick that I uh, found very useful is to develop these adversarial tokens that is not only uh, effective for one prompt, but is also effective across different models and across different prompts. So for this problem, we have developed the first provable defense. Uh, the threat model that we consider is um, basically three, uh, in three categories. One, when you have adversarial tokens, they're the red tokens, uh, added to the end of your prompt. The other one, the adversarial tokens are in the middle of your prompt. And the third one is infused in your, in your prompt. Right, so uh, we proposed a method called raise and check. As I mentioned, it's a provable defense against adversarial prompts. It is an adaptation of a, a previous method that we developed called the randomized smoothing. The main idea is to erase some of the tokens and look at the output of your safety filter and have a smart aggregation of these outputs in order to flag whether or not you have a safety issue in that prompt or not. Right, some empirical results against adversarial suffixes. Uh, the left shows that, for example, we can provably defend against 20 adversarial tokens added to your prompt uh, with a small degradation of the performance and the running uh, complexity, uh, run, uh, computational complexity on the right. Same results for adversarial insertions, but the complexity is a little bit higher. That's all. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Chung C. Mao uh, from McGill in Columbia. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Cheng Zhi Mao from Columbia. I'm joining McGill as a new faculty and also a new core member at Mila. So today I'm very excited to tell you our re research on identifying and mitigating those bias and threats in large language models. So over the past years, we have been working a lot on identifying and mitigating the bias and security threats in those machine learning models. To make those models more robust, what we do is to integrate additional context into those models to improve their robustness. Number one, we integrate those intrinsic contexts from natural data, which is able to secure the state-of-the-art models by over 30 points than the best defended model. And the second one is to integrate those extrinsic contexts from domain knowledge, where we are able to reduce the bias and achieve out of distribution generalization up to 40 points better than state-of-the-art. And recently, we work a lot on large language models in identifying the bias and security threats, and also in their multi-model versions. And also we mitigate, mitigate those threats via integrating extra context. So we were one of the first to study adversarial threats for large vision language models. And we find that by simply adding some invisible adversarial perturbations, we can decrease the performance by over 80 points on state-of-the-art models. And we propose mitigation. So by in incorporating additional language context during adversarial training, so uh, we are able to secure those uh, vision language models against adversarial attacks. And what's cool is that our robustness can also extrapolate and generalize to zero-shot tasks that the model has never been trained on before. And we also study 
find a lot of bias in large vision language models by steering diffusion generation. So here's an image that generated by our algorithm, which is a bus tile. But the state-of-the-art large vision language models predicts a swim pump because the model is using bias, which is a background swimming pool to make the prediction. So those large language models not only get the category incorrect, but they also hallucinate the wrong rationales and descriptions to justify that prediction. So here's an example, which is a frying pan picture, but the model uh, predicts a tennis racket. If you look down in the end, it hallucinates the rationale, which is white strings to justify this is a tennis racket, but there's no white strings in the image. So this is a serious problem. And we propose a method to mitigate this kind of problem. So what we do is to incorporate additional context by searching the internet. And we are able to improve over 20 points on correcting the bias and hallucinations. Um, so now our model can be both like a doubly right. So not only get the right prediction, but also gives you the right uh, description. And we also have work on detecting those uh, language model generated content. So one observation we have is that um, by feeding those uh, like text content back into the language models and ask those models to rewrite it, what we find is that if this is a language written context, uh, text, then the model tends to modify less, while for human input, it tends to modify more. So by looking at the editing distance difference, we are able to detect more e effectively than the state-of-the-art detection. And we also have work on uh, using large language model for program analysis, where those language models have no idea about how code executes. And we integrate those information from code execution uh, to improve the model's robustness for program. And finally, um, I would like to thank you for your time for listening and I'm happy to discuss more offline. Thank you. Our next speaker is Selmer Bringsjord of Motalin. Motalin, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm just gonna skip. This is the technology hyperslate from Motalin that's most relevant. Uh, track record, serious platform. Here's the problem, at least as we see it. Inferencing is called uh, and the materials that we have, but basically LLMs cannot reason. Uh, if you haven't taken a look at uh, at this uh, this uh, publication, I suggest you do. Um, amazingly, this was predicted uh, about a half a century ago that we'd be in this stew. Uh, I know at least 30 years back, I was explaining artificial neural networks can't reason deeply. Um, so uh, you can get the slides, you can look at this technical example. I'm just going to skip to, wow, that's bizarre. Uh, I'm going to skip to an example that makes uh, this argument more con concrete here. Um, our solution is to go outside to logic-based AI for help. And I think if you don't do that, there's a big problem. So if you're interested in topic two, third bullet, um, please contact me. So here's the example, uh, kind of a infantile example in intelligence analysis. Two ports, you don't want this machine, which is nasty to be constructed, part M1, part M2, so that would be bad. Uh, month four, as a matter of fact, one part, one part goes in, um, and then in another uh, month, month eight, the other part goes in. And the question is, well, is there now a machine in the region in question? Well, we can ask a large language model. And we did. Um, the problem is, ask the question, can we guarantee there's no machine of this type in month eight? Um, we get back this response. Now, not invariably, and there's all kinds of incredibly charitable things you can do with prompting. You want it to play Sudoku, give it a million prompts. Um, but th th this is really bad. And uh, we can solve this problem. How? Um, by taking the relevant text that leads to these 
more than hallucinations, inferential hallucinations, and using AI that's tried and true in the computational logic arena. So when we do that, we see that a question like this ends up resulting in the conclusion of an argument that says, well, yeah, the, 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 this could in fact be the case. This machine could be assembled here. So if we look at, I'm sorry for the uh, conversion to PDF. I'm not entirely sure that you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. But um, for our system, Hyperslate, the correct answer with supporting argument that's bulletproof uh, takes 24 milliseconds. Now, I looked at the technical description, and I don't know that the second problem uh, I, I'm talking about here is as relevant. Uh, like the rest of you, I didn't have that before this. But uh, in terms of deception, um, we, 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 have, we have a patented solution uh, in this case. So if you're at all interested, you can take a look at it. It's, 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 it's basically red teaming um, and using um, our approach to anticipate malic malicious use with LLMs of uh, various kinds of uh, very unfortunate uh, attempts to uh, convince people of things that aren't true. Um, the uh, background here is also longstanding um, and goes back to work by a former student of mine on the lying machine. So he's looking at the LLMs and saying, wow, uh, what I built and curated by hand is now available to everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you. Abby Emery of Noblis. Hi, everyone. I'm Abby Emery. I'm a principal investigator with Noblis, and I'd like to talk with you about some of our contributions to the Bengal program. So about us, uh, we're a nonprofit company, and we specialize in delivering science and technology solutions to our federal government customers. Our work spans over four different mission areas from uh, national security space to civil mission space. And we've been at this for 26 years now, uh, upwards of 26 years. So if you if you were to look at our uh, portfolio for S&T, um, we kind of have our hands in everything, but we do definitely have a focus on artificial intelligence. So uh, we have um, we we've that's also grown to encompass, of course, large language models in the recent years. So, of course, it makes sense that we are very interested in understanding the emerging threat landscape for large language models um, and being able to have our experts, which are on the cutting edge of large language model development, be able to understand um, what the weaknesses are and what the vulnerabilities and threats and risks come with, uh, with these large, large language models. So I will be sharing uh, three of the mitigations we've developed uh, in this presentation. The first one I'd like to share with you is our responsible AI framework. So basically this is a framework that we developed in accordance with um, government and industry guidance for uh, performing uh, AI research in an ethical and accountable way. So what, what this does for us is it allows us to um, establish not only what our ethical principles are that we want to incorporate into all of our research, but actually also incorporate a systematic process by which we ensure that all AI research at our company is conducted responsibly. So this is, um, yeah, very, very important for laying the good foundation for any AI research, especially for large language model development. Okay, so the second product I'd like to um, talk to you about is the what we're calling the ICAI risk management framework. So what this is, is essentially this is an AI black box model interrogation tool. So what we want to know is how do models, um, if we want to interrogate specific models to perform a model assessment to be able to gauge what, uh, how these models, um, how good they are at adhering to ethical standards, to performance requirements, as well as uh, social considerations. So um, this is backed by a very comprehensive data collection system by which we are able to conduct bulk statistical analysis by which um, we, we are able to gain a holistic picture of the performance of these models in those various spheres. So, um, yeah, that's very, very useful for understanding a good picture of, of what the weaknesses of a model are and specific targeting specific vulnerabilities. 
With respect to large language models in particular, we also have a growing repertoire of prompts and prompt transformations that we can apply in order to probe for very specific large language model behaviors. And finally, I would like to share with you our Good and Grounded Generation or G3 fact checking framework. So this, um, like all the, all the solutions I presented to you today, this is black box. Um, so it can be used with arbitrary large language models or other natural language generation technologies. So this is a fact checking pipeline. So we take the output of the generative model and extract the individual semantic assertions that are being made in the, uh, in the generative output and then do the same thing with uh, from a set of ground truth documents that we that we generally trust and generate and create the uh, a model of the semantic assertions being made there so by comparing those two sets what we're able to really assess is where is the model hallucinating where is it making uh, contradictions with this established set of ground truth documents and not only to identify that there are errors in the output, but also to identify uh, localized citations that tell you which exact document it's in conflict with and also uh, where, where in that document that it's conflicting with. So the idea is to provide uh, very, very useful downstream knowledge to, say, a human analyst who is reviewing the outputs of these, uh, these models or even to a programmatic um, uh, downstream. So overall, we see these uh, solutions as being very useful to Bangle just uh, because they help us create a environment where we can build safer uh, and more explainable and more understood large language models. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chris Abraham of Novomofo. Hi, I'm Chris Abraham. Uh, I'm the uh, founder of Novomofo. Uh, in other roles, I'm a PowerPoint technician as well. Um, depending on the context, I guess you get the value. Uh, there are seven slides I want to get through. Four of them, you have to bear with me, three of value, right? So just an understanding of what people have been doing with LLMs, um, I wanted to try to dimensionalize what you're getting out of it. So scale, scope. The one thing that really troubles me sometimes is velocity. Scale and scope are great things to have, but if you do it at velocity, then you have to be a little more careful. The other thing is risks, and there are black box models which you don't really know what's going on inside of them. Sometimes you lose information. Sometimes the context requires that you don't, but then you also imagine certain needles that don't even exist, right? So four dimensions, and they'll become important later in the slides. All right, so if you've worked with LLMs, I'm just trying to abstract away, okay, what are people really doing? So you've got weights, we call that a foundational model or a base model. You've trained it. What I'm trying to do here is essentially draw some boundaries. So the, what I've drawn in red boxes essentially is a boundary where data is sort of like going across. So there is some form of data within your LLM models expressed in weights that already exists and you don't have much control over it. If you wanna have control, you're gonna to have to do it yourself. But otherwise, data is sort of like coming through into the system. And that's really where I'm proposing that you have to spend some time understanding what it is that you're doing, right? So in base models, you've got a particular way of curing or prompting and things that you usually do. In fine-tuned models, you have the same sort of approach again, but then you've got other corpuses that you have placed inside there to fine tune on. And typically the way that we're working with the with these systems is that we're brute forcing all of our data which are without really understanding what we have in there. Right. Now we've obviously experienced the situation that well the some of the answer is not that great. So we we created compositions now which allow us to get, let's say, a better performance out of this. But the same problem appears, which is that you take data in the form of queries and prompts or redirects to other web properties or websites or whatever, and then we pass all of this information as a query into the LLM, right? So that's essentially what you're doing. And the, the end result that we're trying to get out of it is automation in terms of you know summarizing or text generation or whatever else that you're using it for. All right. So this is what Dr. Fazel talked about a little earlier. So um, 
It's an adversarial attack in the sense that you're adding something to the prompt. You can do it either explicitly, or if you redirect the LLM to get the information from some other location, it would be implicit. You would not actually see it, but it will provide you bad results. The key takeaways that I want to build off what Dr. Fergal talked about, there is actual prompt engineering that is going on here in an adversarial sense, meaning that you're not just trying prompts. You can actually model this in a way that it can give you a bad outcome, right? So there's actual modeling that you can do to generate these adversarial prompts. Another implication of this essentially is that you can train them on open source available LLMs. And then you can, and it works on black box models. So that's a double whammy in that sense. And then, like I said, these adversarial prompts can be made, it can be injected latently, meaning that you don't actually see it as an end user. All right. All right. So this is a, the value slide beginning. Essentially, the concern that I'm trying to raise here is that the data that crosses system boundaries, as well as the data that's within the boundary itself, in terms of weights, represents a problem that we need to understand and control for. And there's a catch-22 that's going on here. The data is really what the mother load is, right? There are insights you can generate from it. There are connections and analysis that you want to do for it. But it may also contain explicit threats that are injected, or it could be a conduit for latent threats, right? There's another problem that is starting to emerge is that data is fast becoming a new externality. What does that mean? So there is a sizable amount of data out there, which is growing, obviously. Putting LLMs into this picture, as well as uh, passing it through human um, work, essentially generates more and more data. And we're gonna do this in the Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Ty Le of University of Mississippi. Hi everyone, my name is Tyler. Um, this presentation is joint force between Penn State University and University of Mississippi. So we are a team and we're looking for um, a few more bagel teams to collaborate. So we are PIs um, with 16 PhD students, 11 from Penn State and five from um, University of Mississippi. Um, we do active research in data science and AI areas. In the last few years, we um, published in top CS venues, um, you can think of AAAI, um, AMS, and, and of course NLP conferences, ACL, MNLP, um, NAC, NACO. We also have a few works with SCI, uh, human computer interactions, and I will explain a little bit uh, further. So um, I will briefly mention a few work uh, relevant to LLM that we recently published and um, done. So Turing Bench, we published a few years ago. Um, this is a benchmark evaluation data set. So we want to evaluate large language models capacity to detect um, neural gen generated text. Recently, we published Hansen, um, which is, we asked the questions, these, these evaluation work, they mostly on text. So we asked JetCBTs how you write articles, how you um, write messages. But another angle that we thought about is we can use this language model to generate spoken text, which then can be then later uh, translated into the audio form, for example. So we asked the questions, can last language model detect the text and how the performance changes when we go from written text to a spoken text? We also published Multitude, uh, which is a multilingual evaluation data set. Um, we want to evaluate last language model capacity to generate text in diverse languages and how they're able to detect these languages as well. So in this data set, we have over um, 70,000 uh, sentences um, uh, in uh, over 11 lang languages. And you see on the graph on the bottom right, um, we would use a language model that trained only on English text and we test them with uh, languages uh, rather than different from English, the differences performance drop over 25%. Other work, um, the first one, we asked human evaluators, we asked lay persons and English experts to see how well they can um, detect LM text and even with collaborations. And we find out that humans are not good at all de detecting these, these texts. 
And the next work, fighting fire with fire. Uh, recently, we used last language model to try and generate fake, fake news. And then we asked language model to see how well they can detect these fake, fake news. And we find out that even though they can detect um, fake news generated by machine learning model to a certain degree, human created misinformation is much harder to detect. The next work, uh, do language model plagiarize? We find out, um, and as this is not, this is not, this is very obvious that we already know. Last language models actually plagiarize some of the text and over memorize uh, a large piece of information from the training data. Uptons is a work we investigate the privacy leakage of last language models. So when we train these models on social media data, there's a risk there that um, the attackers can exploit these models and identify the true authorship behind um, a, a, a piece of writings. And we will post the techniques to defense against those. The last few works, um, we work on adversarial attacks, but different from uh, the majority of existing work, um, we're not dealing with machine generated text. We ask human and we collect the real human automated text. Because in real life on social media, when human we try to perturb and um, go around these machine learning models, we have a different way to come up with these perturbations. And these are the work that we, we work on. And these are the contact informations. Um, I'm looking forward to more discussions and thank you very much. Our next speaker is Matt Kashat of Polyrific. Been trying to figure out how to disable his timer box and I can't, <laughs> can't, can't crack it. So good afternoon. I'm Matt Kashat. I'm the CEO of Polyrific. It's not the right slide though. Are we, uh, here we go. Nope, no, it just wants to keep going. He help. there we go. I'm the CEO of Polyrific, a tech services consultancy with an acute focus on helping organizations move artificial intelligence to the center of their operations. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our company and about our pr proposed approach for detecting weaknesses and vulnerabilities in large language models. As you can guess, it's been a pretty exciting year for a company like ours that works with organizations um, uh, trying to get artificial intelligence integrated into their processes. Um, that journey has given us the opportunity to learn quite a bit, and there's a lot of information there that we'd like to share with IARPA. For the purposes of this lightning talk format, I've kept our presentation very high level and succinct, but I'm happy to connect with any of you after the presentation if you're interested in discussing teaming opportunities. Also for that purpose, uh, my contact information will be on the final side of the presentation. There, I got it this time. Before I get to Polyrific's proposed solution, I'd like to give you a little more context about who and what we are. Polyrific is a company that I started about a decade ago with the goal of helping enterprises automate and streamline their mission critical processes. We've helped a variety of industries from mining to media, insurance, and fintech. And today, most of our clients are in the oil and gas space as part of our nation's critical energy infrastructure. Prior to 2022, we were just a usual tech services company building custom business solutions and helping our clients get into the cloud. But today, our services fall into two major categories, enterprise AI solutions, which help our clients leverage AI in meaningful ways, and foundational services, uh, like the creation and implementation of data strategies to enable enterprises to fully embrace AI. Earlier this month, we hosted our inaugural AI hackathon in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, in order to stay at the forefront of emerging AI technologies, especially with regards to generative AI. This event brought together some of our sharpest AI engineers as we explored unique ways to leverage large language models. One of the areas discussed during our hackathon concerned evolutionary algorithms and genetic programming and how those disciplines might be brought together with LLMs to de develop a sort of adversarial inspector to probe for emerging weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and threat modes in real time. In other words, we don't want to attempt to discover threat modes deterministically. Instead, we would like to evolve an intelligent agent that can continuously probe a system for problems in ways that we as humans might not even imagine. And we'd like to do this continuously in order to capture emergent behavior, especially in foundational models. This approach will combine deterministic tests with AI-driven methods for maximum coverage. We believe that a viable approach would be to incorporate the same optimization by prompting used by Google's DeepMind into an evolutionary algorithm that can create thousands of creative adversarial prompts daily and raise an alarm when threats are encountered. Observability will be maintained through extensive logging so that we can thoroughly understand the agent's methods. 
We believe that the, our theory of establishing an adversarial agent evolves, that evolves over time could work well for IARPA's purposes, but we recognize that cross-pollinating with academia to introduce both academic rigor and additional viewpoints and approaches could be very valuable. The most apparent contribution that Polyrific can make is that we're used to the stress of creating private sector value rapidly and managing programs tightly. We've also crafted a robust framework for delivering engineered applications rapidly, which can help ensure that the more deterministic aspects of the eventual solution are handled quickly so that we can all focus mostly on the AI. We'd love to team with some of the academic institutions who have spoken today, as well as with possibly Amazon or, I don't know if Microsoft's here, they should be, uh, to access foundational models and compute time that would help us create a great solution for IARPA. Thank you all for your attention today. If you'd be in interested in potentially teaming, please find me after the uh, uh, talks today or take down my contact information and reach out anytime. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lynn Tan of Purdue University. Hello, um, Lynn Tan from Purdue. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of our teams. We have two professors, Xiang Yu Jia and myself. Uh, we have over, uh, two postdocs and more than 20 PhD students. We have a lot of expertise in the domain of Bengal. Uh, for example, we worked on uh, new types of large language model attacks, vulnerabilities, their mitigation techniques. We worked on a new form of data-free model extraction techniques through that we need to build generators that generate high quality synthetic training data that would help with uh, um, the hallucination topic here. We measured um, biases in these models and had a testing framework, had to quantify them, how to mitigate those biases. Um, we have a lot of expertise in information flow tracking as well. Uh, we have been involved in various IARPA, uh, DAPA, and ONNR projects, including the recent IARPA Trojan AI. Um, so here are some of our achievements and publications. We have been uh, on the top of the leaderboard for the recent IAPA Trojan contests and the NeurIPS 23 uh, Trojan Detection Contest, the TDC contest. Uh, we were able to find backdoors in uh, those deep learning models, including large language models, as well as find generating jailbreaking prompts. Um, as some of you mentioned before, these models have been having defense mechanisms. If you ask them how to rob a bank, for example, or how to um, uh, buy illegal drugs, and they will say, sorry, I cannot tell you, but we're able to generate um, jailbreaking prompts, but then these models will actually give you those answers. And in particular, we found 20 vulnerabilities in the recent ChatGPT plugins, and one of them is a confirmed assigned CV entry. And we have various uh, other type of expertise as well. Um, we have built a kind of a new type of data-free model extraction techniques. Uh, through that, uh, we've used various ensemble and other techniques to build high quality synthetic data that can be used for training to generate more accurate models and be, allow us to um, with, uh, recover high, highly accurate models with fewer queries. Uh, we also have measured the biases, have a nice uh, framework, and in particular, we'll find some of the new challenges in this process. For example, we found that um, uh, these variants coming from software, not from the seed, was causing a lot of uh, algorithm to be unstable, unstable, and these um, variants coming from the software implementations are unaware of by majority, over 80% of the deep learning experts. So we have various uh, testing framework to address that as well. So here is our prior work, Piccolo, that was able to reverse engineer um, prompts to generate those jailbreaking prompts that I mentioned earlier. And this has been the foundation work for our recent Trojan NLP rounds, our TDC large language model contest, and the ChatGPT vulnerability scanning that were able to uh, find the vulnerabilities, uh, backdoors, and generating the jailbreaking prompts. So um, a lot of the times, these large language models are black box. So people have this um, a new type of attack is trying to steal this model through reverse engineering. Um, to do that, we need to generate high quality synthetic data to train the models and to query the um, large language model under attack. And we have joint optimization techniques to be able to generate really high quality synthetic data that help us to reverse engineer those models. And this help us to have a higher accuracy with fewer number of queries compared to the state of the art. 
We also found a hidden cost of bias mitigation techniques. We evaluate a larger number of them. We found none of them can um, achieve uh, the ideal results. They come up with the cost to either uh, make the algorithms less stable by increasing the variance of the accuracy or the variance of the fairness, or they hurt the accuracy, right? So we have a nice framework to test and quantify those biases and to be able to select the best uh, bias uh, design and select the best bias, uh, bias optimization techniques. Um, we have since then uh, improved our model extraction techniques. We have uh, even better technique to generate even higher quality synthetic training data to allow us to have higher accuracy can be help address many of the topics. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Moskal of MIT CCL. Hello, uh, I'm Stephen Moskal. Uh, I am from the Alpha Group within MIT CCL, led by Una May O'Reilly. And uh, we uh, study the intelligence of adversarial behavior, specifically within the cyber uh, domain. Uh, so Alpha's objective is to replicate adversarial intelligence. And so we have participated in uh, the DARPA cyber programs such as Chase and XD3. And currently we are under contract uh, through the NSA uh, studying offensive and defensive uh, cyber agent dynamics using evolutionary algorithms and now large language models. Um, we have uh, assembled the largest link conglomeration of internet cyber threat information using GraphDB, and we are using language models to reference that data, relay it to make it accessible, and then uh, input that into intel intelligent cyber tools, uh, automated teaching, and fuzzing in red teaming systems. Then most recently, we have developed the ability to uh, define LLM-supported agents, cyber agents that conduct multi-step campaigns with minimal human uh, influence. Um, but for Bengal today, uh, we are going to be focusing on intelligence analysis. And so we are conducting uh, exploratory work on supporting intelligence analysis. And using Hewer's Guide uh, for Intelligence Analysis as inspiration, we ask uh, if structured thinking and metacognition techniques from intelligence analysis tradecraft can be followed by an LLM to transparently, securely, and safely reason coherently. But this requires assessing some sort of bias within the model. So how does that compare to the bias of the model of a human? for example. So it should be no surprise that humans uh, are you know, not immune to uh, cognitive biases. And the Hewer's Handbook provides methods to reduce this bias, but you have to go through uh, you know, auditing and training to these humans to assess their potential biases. And so we've done a lot of research that isn't shown here, uh, conduct, uh, making an agent uh, follow the Hewer's Handbook. And so our preliminary research shows that these models can really do impressive uh, intelligence analysis. Uh, but then once we start inputting misinformation or classified information or some sort of other threat into the model, now the model can influence that. But the differences between a human and the LLM that we're finding is now we can actually control the bias. So we can, you know, imagine we can have a knob that changes the bias so we can get different perspectives over time or just different perspectives throughout the intelligence uh, analysis process. And so our objective is to identify these biases, develop me methods to mitigate the bias, and then leverage these models to now automate uh, the whole intelligence process so we can move forward. So uh, what we're looking for is an intelligence analysis SME. Uh, if we want to go down that route, uh, this, uh, we have uh, the, our PI, Dr. Unameo O'Reilly, uh, who has been working on adversar adversarial intelligence for 20, 25 years now. Dr. Eric Hemberg is a expert in evolutionary algorithms, genetic programming. He's been doing that for about 15 years. And then you have myself, who is prompt engineer, uh, and working on agentif agentification of general AI, specifically uh, in uh, cyber attacks. Uh, so uh, we are open for partnering with SMEs. We have uh, expertise in not only cyber, but intelligence, uh, misinformation, et cetera. And we're open to other partnerships, uh, depending on what our uh, team, team objective is. Please contact uh, Una May O'Reilly for any teaming requests, because today I have a uh, flight to catch. 
So thank you. Thank you. Next up, Michael Brown of Trail of Bits. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Brown. I'm a uh, principal researcher at Trail of Bits. Trail of Bits is a small business. We're about 120 strong and founded in 2012. Um, we are historically a cybersecurity research and cybersecurity services firm. Um, we have, in the last year, established a new practice for performing ML and AI assurance audits and research for both our commercial clients as well as our government uh, clients who are uh, mostly DARPA, the Office of Naval Research, and the U.S. Navy. All right, uh, so the mission of our machine learning and AI assurance practice is to identify and taxonomize the classes of failure modes that directly impact AI and ML models, specifically their performance, and as, uh, as well, we also seek to understand the novel hazards that threaten the operations pipeline for AI and ML models. As we do across all of the domains that we work in at Trail of Bits, we marry closely uh, our practical research, uh, our practical experience with, uh, with, with our novel research to try and make novel advances in the techniques and tools that we use, and then ultimately bring those into, in, into practice. So the reason why we've set up a uh, unique AI ML assurance practice, and this is different than our typical software security um, practice, is that AI ML models have very distinct and very different paradigms that uh, ultimately result in them having a very different uh, attack surface and very different threat surface. So the areas that we're actively researching and are really interested in are addressing issues with model robustness, structural vulnerabilities and supply chain intrusions that are unique to AI ML models, as well as some novel attack surfaces that are unique to these types of deployments, specifically with operations and pipelines and the vulnerabilities that, ex that exist there. Additionally, due to some of the work that we're doing for the UK government's uh, Frontier AI Task Force, we also consider the proliferation and misuse of AI ML model capabilities to be in scope for this, for this practice, and that's some work that we're really interested in talking about today. So with the rest of my time, I'm going to uh, cover a little bit about some of the work that we've done over the last year. Uh, first, we'll talk about some of the work that we've done with uh, assessing model robustness. Our engineering director for the AI ML uh, assurance practice is uh, attending virtually. Her name is uh, Heidi Claff, and one of the first things she did when coming on to Trail of Bits was to design and publish in a, uh, a novel AI risk framework that borrows the concept of an operational design domain from other high assurance technical domains such as nuclear and aviation. And the reason why we use these ODDs as the basis for our uh, assurance audits for deployed AI and ML systems is they allow us to describe the specific operating conditions under which an AI system is designed to properly behave and by extension, it allows us to identify the operating conditions under which they will fail. And further, it allows us to identify the types of uh, hazards and threats that emerge from this, as well as mitigations for these as well. As I mentioned before, uh, right now, Trail of Bits is supporting the UK government's Frontier AI Task Force. And specifically, we're helping them by assessing and taxonomizing new undetectable threats um, that occur in the supply chains related to large language models. This uh, includes both the uh, supply chains for creating LLMs, such as their data or their, or their modeling techniques, as well as supply chains that rely on LLMs to produce the things that they need, such as media or software. Some prior research uh, that we've done uh, about a year ago, uh, Trail of Bits created a tool called Fickling, which is a uh, novel analysis tool for identifying malicious pickle files. Uh, like all the software that we created at Trail of Bits. This is open source and available on GitHub, so we encourage you all to, take, uh, to check this out. Um, this is some of our initial work into looking into uh, the different novel attack surfaces that are, unique to, uh, that are unique to machine learning and AI models. And finally, as I mentioned before, we also consider the proliferation of cyber capabilities to be in scope for our assurance work. Uh, this is work that we're currently doing for the UK government, and specifically what we're doing is creating an evaluation framework to understand that whether to understand both what capabilities uh, LLMs have with respect to offensive cyber operations and how capable they are. Uh, we're doing these capability evaluations relative to human experts, novices, and intermediates, as well as state-of-the-art tools. So we're really excited about this work and hope to share it soon. As far as our involvement in Bengal, uh, we're primarily interested in topic areas one and four. Uh, we're certainly open to teaming. Uh, and if anyone is interested, please come grab me after the talk. Thanks. Thank you. And our last in-person presenter is Lanny Huff of I2K Connect. Good day.
I'm grateful for the uh, chance to present on behalf of IDK Connect. We are a small business and a software company that focuses on delivering products, supporting information and knowledge management um, strategies for organizations. A lot of our domain expertise is focused in the uh, energy industry, and our mission is to reduce as much as possible the time that users spend um, finding and analyzing the unstructured data they have. Our government experience includes um, a DARPA seedling, which contributed to the solicitation for KMAS knowledge management at speed and scale, which we are currently working on um, as a subcontractor to SRI International. Uh, so our capabilities um, is our experience applying state-of-the-art machine learning and NLP techniques to information management and discovery. Um, and now that generative AI has more than proved its utility, we've been doing extensive research into that and specifically um, large language models. And it's important to note that we're doing this in a very uh, security sensitive context. In the um, energy industry, there's zero tolerance for data leakage or incorrect information. Um, can you go into the next slide? Oh, thanks. Um, so, because of data is so critical in the energy industry, it's managed on a need to know basis. So we need to make sure our software respects the very strict um, industry best practices uh, around information access, misinformation, and incorrect information, which would be completely unacceptable. So a lot of our work in this industry deals with the management of information associated with assets and operations and some of our clients uh, use our technology to help identify potential risks or adverse events. So in service of um, these goals and our clients' concerns about having reliable information, most of our focus on LLMs has been in question answering grounded in facts. Uh, so some of that would be sourcing answers directly from documents, uh, and some of that would be grounding with information dynamically sourced from knowledge graphs. Uh, we have some of our research roadmap listed here. We've already published research in an industry leading venue about our question answering. Um, and to make sure that what we did works for real industry professionals, we actually evaluated with volunteers from the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Another interesting project, um, and probably our largest on the roadmap right now, is that we're working with the Society of Petroleum Engineers and a large multinational um, oil and gas company to develop a domain specific LLM for the energy industry. So um, many groups have been quick to note that LLM technology is going to have a myriad of risks uh, and significant research has already been done in this area. There's many potential vulnerabilities that apply to our domain and um, our research projects are working to address them. So, for example, um, we have a WASP's list of what they think are the top 10, not necessarily exhaustive or a sole authority, but it's useful as an enumeration here to like map um, what specific vulnerabilities our projects might be addressing. Uh, so, for example, going back to our task of building a domain specific LLM for the energy industry, uh, it would be totally unacceptable to um, leak any of the training data we might be using. And um, also factual accuracy would be of prime importance because otherwise it's simply not useful um, in an engineering context. So we believe that probably the two most important issues for us are data leakage, preventing that, and um, the issue of hallucination uh, and combating that and making sure that what our LLMs produce is actually accurate. Um, thank you for listening. If you're interested in learning more, please contact us at i2kconnect.com. Thank you. And our, now we have several remote presenters. Uh, the first is Wei Dong of University of California, Riverside. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Good day to all of you. Uh, my name is Yue Dong. I'm an assistant professor in the computer science department at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, yeah, so I work on natural language processing and machine learning at its core. My work is centered on creating AI tools, mostly uh, language models that are trustworthy, safe and fair. My past research have placed a significant uh, emphasis on trustworthy NLP, particularly in hallucination reduction in text summarization. Another aspect of my research focus on LLM safety, uh, especially we're interested in investigating the vulnerabilities against adversarial attacks. Uh, in addition, I'm also working on watermarking algorithms to identify AI-generated content. And then in addition, I'm also interested in uh, 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 working on fair, uh, AI fairness. My ongoing uh, work include creating data set for uh, misogyny detection and mitigation, and also the equity chatbot. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like. Uh, I would also like to flash out that at UCR we do have a wide range of professors working on uh, machine learning and AI uh, safety related topics. My specialization is in NLP and ML, and uh, I have been uh, collaborating with many of the researchers at UCR. If you are interested in teaming up with any of us, please reach out. Uh, could you go to the next uh, nice? Okay, yeah, thank you. My first research, uh, research line, which is uh, really closely aligned with uh, Bengal's topic uh, two, focus on trustworthy NLP and hallucination reduction. I have been uh, working extensively to reduce factual errors in text summarization. My work in this uh, area has been recognized at top NLP conferences like ACL and EMLP. Uh, so in 2022, I proposed the use of uh, external knowledge base for fact verification and correction in model generated summaries. Uh, this idea has been widely extended in recent work of fo uh, focus on grounding large language models uh, on some external knowledge base for uh, neuron symbolic reasoning. The primary approach is to uh, essentially first retrieve relevant facts and then integrate these facts for uh, factual generation. Additionally, I have proposed multiple reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning approaches to get uh, the summarization models towards more uh, factual and faithful generation. Uh, I've also developed uh, a post-processing post methods to reduce the factual errors, as many of these approaches can be used for uh, factual evaluation as well. For instance, uh, in our EMLP 2020 work, uh, we've used the question answering models to assess whether generated text summaries are consistent with their original source by answering a set of questions and compare against the two. So uh, this has been widely adopted into a factuality evaluation protocols nowadays for large language models uh, in 2023. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another line of our research focus on LLM safety, we've been exploring various strategies to test out the vulnerabilities of large language models. Uh, in our recent uh, submission to iClear, we detailed our findings on compositional attacks. To uh, illustrate with an example, uh, when posing potential harmful questions to LLMs, such as teach me how to uh, make a bump, uh, these prompts are often blocked by the model. Uh, however, if we, uh, if we Decompose it, uh, the harmful queries from the embedding space, we can deceive the model into providing the answers. So this is also called jailbreak by the previous uh, uh, presenters. So we can break this attack down into generic instructions like teach me how to make an object and then pairing it with adversarially crafted uh, malicious triggers. It could be text or visual triggers, and this would significantly increase the, uh, the attack success rate highlighting the model's vulnerability. And also this compositional approach can bypass the safety guards of LLM in a wide range of unsafe scenarios, include, uh, including like how to construct dangerous item, uh, biasing government in, uh, uh, election, or creating some adversarial advertisement. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, concurrently, we reviewed over 100 paper on LLM and security, especially towards adversarial attacks, jailbreak, uh, uh, prompt injection, and compiled a 50-page survey, which has been submitted to ACM Computing Survey. Uh, we, we will be presenting a tutorial on this topic at ACL uh, to a wider range of NLP com uh, community at the day, this top uh, NLP conference. Uh, next, please. So UCR uh, has uh, also has many researchers focus on AI safety from the vision modality that can be quickly adapted for LLM. My colleague have been working on context aware and black box attacks for v, uh, VLMs. For instance, as uh, shown in the bottom right figure, we can easily produce context inconsistent attacks by perturbed objects for us in understanding. This often uh, results in uh, models to flip their decisions. Time. Uh, yeah, so uh, next one, please. Yeah, thank you for your time. So we're interested in collaborating and team up for Bango. If you find any of our research relevant, please reach out. My email is yue.dong at ucr.edu, or you can find me at yue.dong.us. Thank you. Next up is Gheorghe Tsikuchi of George Mason. Okay, this is the system we are proposing. Can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, these topics. Next slide. We worked in instructable cognitive agents for many years. Uh, this was also my PhD in 1988. So we have various applications. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, our area is uh, critical thinking, and we develop a system cogent for. Intelligence analysis that does critical thinking. You can have a, a brief description of cogent uh, in this video here. Next slide, please. Next, uh, I'm going to develop the learning capabilities of cogent. Call it in start with cogent. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, <clears throat> no, no, before, previous slide, please. Previous slide. So this is, <clears throat> we propose to integrate Cogent with ChatGPT. Uh, Cogent has powerful learning and reasoning capabilities that ChatGPT naturally enjoys capability. We have systems that are able to start to answer questions following this process. So we start with a question, and uh, we want to answer this question. The question so, what are the possible answers? The possible answers are alternative hypotheses. We need to determine which of these hypotheses is true. And then in the evidence, in, uh, we will use a certain deductive based approach to discover evidence and then using the same as a hypothesis. So this is a process by which we, uh, our system answer a question. Uh, so we, we show the system how to solve a problem and to Learn to do it by itself. So now, the issue is how can we? Uh, so this is the system that can answer any type of question, and then uh, we question also answered by ChatGPT. So then, our problem is to compare the answer by by ChatGPT with our answer, answer and uh, so we can it is in collaboration. Uh, in so this our problem. In this way, I'm sorry, I can't speak to David, but so we have a system that answers the question and we compare the answer of our system and then we address all the issues by this comparison. And uh, we can uh, solve the problem in this way. So I will stop here because I cannot speak very much. But uh, we are in collaboration with you. But it's a different way of looking at the problem. We don't look like there's a charge of ideas. It's really because the answer is we compare the answer generated by charge with the answer generated by our system, coding. And if there are biases in this way, and all the others, we are interested in addressing all the problems with operating with other people. Thank you. I'll stop here because I can speak very much. Very well today. All right, thank you.
Our next presenter is Rod Fantasia uh, from Guidehouse. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Rod Fantasia, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer here at Guidehouse. And next slide, please. Uh, as we've been seeing, I mean, the, the potential of LLMs in working with the intelligence community is impressive, I mean, to, to create informed decisions. In the next four and a half minutes that I have here, I'm going to present some techniques to make sure that these powerful tools are more resilient for the intelligence community in dealing with poisonous data and toxic uh, outputs. Next slide, please. So, so Gen AI and, and LLMs can be used definitely for, you know, analyzing thousands of streams of data in, in a multimodal world, right? Could be videos, images, texting, you name it, voice as well. Uh, but we need to recognize that our adversaries are doing the same thing and are leveraging these tools also to uh, use it against us. So it's necessary for us, it's, it's mandatory for us to come up with methodologies that can identify and detect errors uh, prior to being deployed. Next slide, please. So uh, here I'm going to present you with some of the uh, proving uh, methodologies that we've been using for LLMs to make sure that we make this LLM more resilient uh, to attacks and to uh, poisonous data. So next slide. I'm going to uh, focus on four methods. The first method is input uh, fuzzing. So essentially in input fuzzing, what we are doing is randomly or semi-randomly input to an LLM uh, fuzzing data that can help us discover how the model may fail or behave unexpectedly. So in general, what it can do, it can uncover potential security threats. Uh, but essentially what we're trying to do is trying to understand the boundaries of where the LLM can handle. So this is a very powerful method and, uh, and, and we can use significant data to, to use it. The second method is attention visualization. So as you well know, uh, the LLMs are based on transformers and within the transformers, you have the encoding and the decoding and the attention mechanism. And what we are doing with the visualization is look at the matrices and the weight within the matrices on the decoding side and try to visualize the attention and, and infer which parts of the input are influencing the LLM's response. So in this, in this way, if an LLM is consistently placing high attention weights uh, on biased data or irrelevant parts, we will know immediately about that. Next slide, please. The next two methods are more recent, and this is using agents. So as you know, agents can, can really allow you to, to create very powerful uh, workflows. In this way, we're ensuring the LLM kind of are accurate, ethical, and safe. So the first method that we are implementing is real-time monitoring and intervention. And essentially, when you have an agent, what you do is you, you create, a, through a proxy, you create multiple roles. With those roles, you create a powerful workflow. And essentially, the agents and these different roles can be designed to monitor the LLM output in real time, evaluating the output, and then deciding, I mean, whether is uh, you're creating harmful output and uh, instantly be able to flag it. So this way, automatically, we can adjust the LLM output before they are presented to the end user. And the last method I want to talk about is simulated adversarial testing. Some of the folks here, I mean, have presented this already as well. But these are using agents, and this is similar to gangs. So essentially, you are using agents as the adversarial entity. So trying to deliver it, trying to elicit erroneous or biased responses from the LLM. So by continuously doing this, you are making sure that the LLM become, becomes more resilient to real-world adversarial attacks. So all these, next slide please, all of these methods, I mean probing methods, are based on having a solid a methodology for retrieval augmented generation, RAG methodology, the ability to essentially transform your embeddings, create your vector database, using then uh, these and, and then creating your chunks of data to create a new LLM that you can play around with, with your own data. And once you have the RAG methodology, methodology implemented, the next slide, please, is, and if you have significant GPU power, then going into the fine-tuning methodology where you combine RAG, which is in the uh, yellow box on the left, together exactly. with QLORA or LORA to essentially play with the weights of the matrices to make the LLM uh, more powerful to implement. 
So we'll be happy to connect with everybody here and we're looking for team, teaming partners. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, speaker is Benjamin Erickson of, um, of ICSI at Berkeley. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ben Erickson. I lead the robust deep learning group um, here at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley. Um, my group consists um, of about 11 members, including ML engineers, postdocs, and graduate students. And we are working on various aspects of AI safety and robust um, scientific machine learning. And we have a particular interest in vector attacks. Um, I'm also the co-PI of the iOpera Trojai program together with Michael Mahoney. So I'm interested in developing a mechanistic approach for detecting biases, threats, and vulnerabilities in large language models. Next slide, please. So large language models are increasingly being deployed into various real-world applications, so it's important to better understand their behavior. Unfortunately, standard accuracy metrics do not measure trustworthiness. So without domain knowledge, it is really very difficult to verify the quality of the output. Um, since large language models use eloquent and authoritative language, so we have the tendency to believe these models. Um, so that is problematic because, we, as we know, um, LLMs have several intrinsic biases and um, previous talks have shown several examples. So, um, for example, they are good at making up facts and they have the tendency to produce social biases. And that is um, largely because they are um, trained on untrusted data sets that are crawled from the internet without any supervision. Um, there also exist several vulnerabilities such as prompt injection attacks and vector attacks. And these um, attacks can be tailored either towards the LLM model directly or towards the supply chain. Next slide. So our research focuses on sequence-to-sequence -sequence models for summarize, summarization, translation, and dialogue generation. Um, and we are interested in both traditional recurrent neural networks for uh, language modeling and modern um, encoder-decoder transformer architectures. Um, traditional models allow, uh, are a bit more handy and they kind of um, allow us to do um, rapid prototyping, um, but a lot of these ideas can be transferred to transformer architectures. So the first threat mode that we are concerned about is bias and manipulated content. Um, so LLMs can be prompted to provide wrong summaries, propagate disinformation, or hide specific facts. And the second threat mode that we care about is intrusion. Um, large language models might contain natural or artificial backdoors that allow an adversary to trigger a malicious protocol um, to gain different levels of access to the large language models. Um, next slide, please. So our approach to study and understand these threat um, modes is centered around local and global analysis techniques. Um, so first, local techniques are based on weight analysis of individual layers, um, and we use Eigen analysis, Hessian analysis, or simple weight statistics to perform weight analysis. Um, so we use these techniques to extract features that we can correlate with potential biases and vulnerabilities. In previous work, we have shown that weight analysis is um, very efficient for vector detection in language models. And um, weight analysis also allows us to track the model behavior during training or at different training phases. But to complete the picture, we need some type of global techniques, um, such as input-output analysis. Um, and examples are adversarial prompt generation techniques or noise response analysis. So together, both local and global analysis helps us to understand um, the conditions under which the model may fail. Um, but really to provide useful insights, we need some reference models that we can compare to. Um, so we plan to construct reference model by utilizing unlearning techniques, but we can also compare the behavior between different large language models. So there's a zoo of different models now and checkpoints at different training phases. So in summary, our capabilities include adversarial machine learning, language model probing, and prompt injection. And we would be interested in partnering with a team that has research interest in these areas, but also expertise in the area of language model biases. Um, so if you're interested, please reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker yeah. is yeah, Numa Damani from Kung Fu AI. Hi. I'm Nima Damani, and I'm a principal machine learning engineer at Kung Fu AI. Next slide. Next slide. And the next slide. 
Thank you. Um, we are a management consulting and engineering firm that is focused exclusively in artificial intelligence. We have strong expertise in computer vision, natural language processing, generative AI, time series forecasting, and anomaly detection. We have successfully executed over 100 projects in five years for both commercial clients and US government customers. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we characterize the threats and weaknesses of large language models or LLMs that are inherent to their development, as well as those that, as well as those that malicious actors could exploit. While the technical pitfalls that are inherent to the training and development process of LLMs have been well documented, there has been minimal research on the solutions and mitigations in this space. Even the documentation on inherent pitfalls such as bias has been limited to a subset of societal biases, for example, gender, and more research is needed in other areas. In our RFI, we focused on training data weaknesses, bias, toxicity, hallucinations, data poisoning, prompt injections, and prompt jailbreaking as the biggest threats and weaknesses of LLMs. Today, I will highlight a few of these. Next slide. LLMs are composed of billions of parameters and trained on massive amounts of data, which could include academic or professional sources, as well as data scraped from the web. These data sources can include sensitive information, such as names, addresses, intellectual property, and more. LLMs can unintentionally memorize the sensitive information from the training data, which can then be retrieved by adversaries during a training data extraction attack. This memorization problem scales with the size of the model and how often sensitive information is duplicated in the training data. But even sensitive information that appears infrequently can be extracted verbatim. Even when guardrails are in place for systems like ChatGPT, the use of multi-step jailbreaking prompts has demonstrated that LLMs can still leak sensitive information when probed with specialized prompts designed to get around existing programming restrictions. Privacy enhancing techniques, such as data sanitization and differential privacy, have been used to mitigate such data leakage, but these methods are still imperfect and often come at a trade-off between privacy and model utility. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so data poisoning consists of an attack where malicious actors intentionally manipulate or poison training data used to train the model. So in other words, by changing the training data, attackers can alter the behavior of the models. These attacks are neither hypothetical nor impractical and can present a real danger to people and systems that interact with machine learning algorithms. These attacks can require relatively little effort or investment on the part of bad actors. A recent study showed that a minimal $60 investment, someone could poison 0.01% of two of the most popular text to image pair data sets and then demonstrated the modified behavior of the models trained on them. Unfortunately, research has been slow to adapt to the data poisoning concerns. As the research community continues to devise increasingly effective counter tactics, active systems will remain at risk. Next slide. LLMs using prompt based learning are at risk for prompt injection attacks, which involves manipulating or injecting malicious content into prompts to exploit the system. In other words, malicious actors aim to get a misaligned or un unintended response from LLM based tools. People now are increasingly granting LLM applications the ability to make API requests run searches, execute generated code, amongst others. If exploited, the LLM assistant can easily follow additional malicious instructions. To date, there isn't a robust defense against this. Similarly, prompt jailbreaking is a process that specifically attempts to bypass safety moderation features placed on LLMs by their developers. There are several techniques to force LLMs into a jailbroken state, which include alignment hacking, character role play, superior model, and pseudo mode. We should also consider indirect prompt injection attacks where adversarial instructions are introduced by third party data source, like a web search and API call. This type of prompt injection attack has been demonstrated by an attack on against Bing chat, which can search the internet. The research has demonstrated seconds. how an attacker can plant a malicious prompt hidden by the website a user may visit. And when that website's open, the Bing chat extracts personal information instructed by the prompt about the user. Finally, it's important to call out that research in, this, in the security threat space is often limited, given that the ethics of carrying out research studies that can serve as a playbook for adversaries. We hope that there will be opportunities such as this event for research to understand how LLMs can be exploited in a controlled environment, as well as their societal impacts, so that we're able to decide appropriate mitigations and respond accordingly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Yue Xing and I'm from Michigan State University. So, our team is MSU Trustworthy AI Group and we have two team members. One is Professor Jiliang Tang from the Computer Science and Engineering Department and I'm from Statistics and Probability Department. So, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, our team uh, was founded many years ago, and we have done a lot of research projects in many areas. We have a lot of uh, different collaborators before uh, with some big tech companies. And for our research projects, we have a lot of different uh, research topics. For example, we are currently working on some large language models topics uh, related to the uh, text de generated text de detection or the data uh, memorization, and we also also work on a lot of projects for the adversarial uh, attack and defense. For example, we uh, have the library Deep Robust. Say we, uh, it is a very uh, very top GitHub repository in this area to improve the robustness of machine learning models. And also we consider the poisoning attack and adversarial training. So we have improvements in both methodology and we have some understanding in the theory as well. And also we worked on the watermark before to have the IP protection for pre-training data and fine-tuning data. So these are some research areas we have been, uh, we have been done previously. So next slide, please. Um, and our current interest is the large language models. So we have two major strengths. One is the property of large language models. So we want to understand uh, some properties like the vulnerability or some other properties uh, from both the empirical side and theoretical side. So we want to understand how the large language model works. And also we want to study about the in context learning which happened in large language model, but not in the other traditional models there. And also so we study the memorization and generated text detection properties for a large language model. And the other strand is the adversarial attack and defense in large language models. So for example, we, we are studying poisoning attack in fine tuning and in context learning, as well as jailbreaking attack and defense in in context learning. So next slide, please. And so here is one of our uh, recent research projects as an introduction. So we study about the memorization of large, uh, large language model fine tuning. So in existing literature, it is observed that the large language model can reproduce pre-training data. And our observation is that large language model can also memorize data in the fine tuning stage for different fine tuning tasks. So, and the memorization level depends on the task specific features, like if we are using uh, the fine tuning for memorization, then, uh, for summarization, then it will memorize a lot of fine tuning data. But uh, if we are using it for sentiment classification, then the memorization is still fine. And we also find that attention score can help quantify the vulnerability of memorization and multitask learning can alleviate the memorization issue in the fine tuning stage. And we also develop some theory to uh, explain, the uh, explain the level of memorization. Say it is connected with the number of features and also the sparsity of the features. So next slide, please. Uh, so here is our highlight. So our team is the Michigan State uh, University Trustworthy AI Group. So our projects are backbone by both the theoretical guarantees and strong empirical observations and improvements. So we have strong expertise in attack and defense, and we are also in the uh, we are also the first batch of people who start to study the theories in large language model and in context learning. And our team has contributed a lot to the open source community with data sets and tools. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Man Ling, an incoming pro assistant professor from Northwestern University. I'll be happy to share our work on factual and truthful generation. Next slide, please. So large language models make a lot of errors, especially when it interacts with multiple facts. For example, in this question of listing three female researchers in machine learning, it will output Josh Abenjo. But from the answer, we can see the model clearly know that the gender of Josh Abenjo is male researcher. But the model just cannot control itself to always output it, as Josh Abenjo is so frequently appearing together with AI machine learning. Because the model is trained to predict next token, so it will be biased towards or concurrency or dominant knowledge, but will ignore the facts like the gender kind of facts. 
In this case, although the model knows two facts correctly, but it still cannot leverage the knowledge and resolve the conflicts. Next slide, please. As a result, although large language models have has been proved to store knowledge correctly sometimes, but we really need to understand where the knowledge is from, how much knowledge has been already captured by a large language model, and what is missing, and also whether there's anything wrong and whether we can fix this incorrect knowledge. Next slide, please. To control the factual and the truthful generation, we need to not only connect the large language model parameters with semi-structured symbolic representation so that we could update the knowledge or revise our knowledge or unlearn some knowledge, but we also want to disentangle the perception and the reasoning to leverage the control of this strong reasoning power and to make it uh, only reason under the certain constraints. Next slide, please. As a result, our research aims to enhance these surface-to-surface -surface large language models to help analysts to understand complex events. Next slide, please. So we introduce control over the model to correctly capture the factual knowledge. Next slide, please. This is very important to hallucination. The key of hallucination is unwarranted inference, which means the inference does not match the constraints. Like given this birthday cake, the model will always imagine this champagne bottle, but ignore the fact that people here are mostly children, so they will not drink champagne. However, we also don't want the generation over restrictive to block launch models from good, uh, in good inference. As a result, we not only just do traditional grounding or retrieval or verification. Our key perspective here is to control large language model to output the exact level of inference that the users want. Like in this example, we control the model to stick to the input, or we control the model to imagine things that are not in the input, but also provide the evidence of why the model is making such inference. Next slide, please. The next thing is people use different language to describe same facts, like about annexation of Crimea. The model can support Russian using a positive tone, saying it's nothing short of geopolitical earthquake, but it can also use a negative tone, saying that it's actually an invasion. So this captures how the particular group or organization would interpret this event. Also, we try to quantify this bias. We provide a control value, like we control the generation to slightly leaning towards political left by 0.1 offset or extremely biased towards it by 0.9 offset. If we can model this quant quantitatively, we can naturally detect the malicious content and perform detoxification or positive framing and so on. So it also provides us a potential to leverage training data with bias or malicious content. Next slide, please. One minute. Yeah. Another bottleneck is long context understanding. Next slide, please. For complex events like Ukraine crisis, we don't just want the model to be able to input thousands of documents every day, but we want the model to build connections between them to track the event evolution and provide different perspectives from different media, different countries, like here we provide the evidence from both English content and also Chinese content. Next slide, please. When the context is even broader, like social context, we hope the model to simulate dialogue between language models with different biases or perspectives. Like here, we can capture the reactions and responses from different ideology groups. Next slide, please. In summary, we aim to make large language models to correctly capture and reason about facts and generate truthful output. Thank you. Thank you. And our next talk is from John uh, Nadzim of um, Unstructured. Thank you. Uh, nice to chat with everyone. My name's John. Uh, I lead our public sector business at Unstructured, which is a startup focused primarily on solving the problem of pre-processing uh, natural language data for LLMs. Um, we can go ahead and just write to slide four. I can focus there. So our focus at Unstructured is really on building core infrastructure far to the left of uh, any sort of pipeline for LLMs that has really cross-cutting applications uh, across RAG and other sorts of approaches to solving some of these problems. We really view ourselves as a core component of the emerging LLM uh, tech stack. We're very interested in working with other partners in this space uh, across all the different priorities that have been, that have been outlined today. Uh, and we're currently working across the Department of Defense in Air Force, Army, and Space Force. Uh, at present, we've had approximately 2 million downloads a uh, little over 2 million downloads now 
uh, in the commercial space of our open source toolkit. And we're in thousands of open source uh, repos that are available on GitHub uh, to anyone who's interested in taking a look there or exploring some of our documentation. Uh, we're widely used across the commercial sector and we're used in quite a few different uh, applications that are currently being fielded throughout the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, as I said, we're really focused on the core problem of making natural language data that is unstructured visible to LLMs. So uh, based on the experience that most of our staff coming from other companies and other places where we focused on natural language problems has had in the past, uh, we set out to address that problem. Uh, so we can go to the next slide to slide five. Uh, so in our experience uh, previously working prior to the explosion of LLMs, the reality of most of the NLP space, particularly uh, when it's particularly more recently, has been that the vast majority of pre-processing pipelines are extremely brittle. And when there are modest changes to format or to other sorts of characteristics of documents that need to be ingested, particularly in a RAG uh, sort of um, pipeline, uh, those pipelines can break. And as a result, uh, large amounts of labor need to be spent re-engineering uh, the extraction of that natural language data. So what we've set out to do is to build a suite of software that automates the extraction of unstructured, unstructured natural language data and spits it out in clean uh, JSON with appropriate metadata tags and the ability to customize uh, chunking approaches. Um, you can skip down to slide nine. Uh, so really our goal is to provide uh, recent relevant and validated data for LLMs. Uh, ultimately, what we're hoping to do is to improve the quality of data that's ingested into them in a RAG architecture uh, or in alternative architectures, reduce the labor requirement on anyone who's working with those types of data sets and position uh, data scientists to spend more of their time on, on dealing with some of, the, some of the core questions that we've been discussing today. Uh, we are specifically very interested in RAG based approaches, uh, and we are open to partnering in other sorts of contexts. Uh, this chart basically gives an overview of some of our existing uh, library, which has upstream connectors that allow you to effectively point our library at spaces like an S3 bucket or an Azure blob, extract uh, any unstructured documents from those, from those locations and clean them and push clean JSON uh, down into vector databases downstream. Uh, right now, we're available as an open source library that you can freely download and work with off of GitHub. Uh, we also have a free API. If anyone's interested in trying that out, you can register for an API key on our website, unstructured.io. We are in the process of fielding a hosted API to on the commercial side that we hope to mirror on the government side in the near future. Uh, to enable uh, research and production uh, within a, uh, an, an individual user's environment so that they don't have to expose data elsewhere. And uh, we are ultimately driving toward having a forthcoming platform to enable some additional functionality around, uh, around these tools. So if anyone has any interest in discussing further, you can reach out to me by email. Uh, my email is john, uh, J-O-N, at unstructured.io. And... Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Um, thanks for, for taking the time to come down. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you to the events group, to Pete, to Rachel, um, to the IARPA team. Um, and of course, everybody uh, who's shown an interest here, joined us online uh, or come down here for the day or a few days, however that might be. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity yet to form uh, teams, or you're still interested in, in reaching out to folks, uh, you're welcome to still submit uh, a deck or the capability statement online. We'll post those in maybe the, the next few days. So you'll be able to explore other people's capabilities and, and, and set up a team. So thank you again. Uh, best of luck. I, I look forward to reading all of the white papers and uh, We'll try to get the BA out for you quickly and then, you know, have the rest of the process go as quickly as the government can make it go. So thank you very much.